You're listening to Lean Travel, copyright Fast Cap Press. To find all the videos and resources you'll be hearing about, just go to paulacres.net under books. And now, Lean Travel, written and narrated by Paul A. Akers. Hi, everyone. This is Paul Akers, and welcome to Lean Travel. You know, most of you know that I'm a maniac about lean. I think about lean 24-7. I think about it at work. I think about it at home. And yes, I think about it when I travel as well. And that's the essence of what this book is all about. How I applied simple lean principles to the way I travel. Now, if any of you follow me on Facebook, you know that I'm always somewhere in the world. People can't believe how much I travel. Well, you know why I travel that much? for two reasons. Number one is I love life and I love meeting people. And frankly, I like the spice of life that travel brings into my life. So much diversity, so many interesting people, so many fantastic cultures that absolutely saturate who I am and develop me into a better human being. So travel is a very important part of my life. It's so important that five days from now, I'm gonna be getting on a private jet, can you believe that? And traveling to over 11 countries around the world shooting a documentary about sustainable forestry. We're gonna be visiting some of the most spectacular forests from Guatemala to Cameroon, you name it, we're gonna be there. So travel has become an integral part of who I am. So it makes sense that I would write a book about travel and how to do it well and how to make it meaningful. So welcome to Lean Travel. Author's Note, The One Thing. Often when I read books, I'm not quite sure what the author's main point is. So I find myself racking my brain to figure out what they're trying to communicate at both the book level and chapter level. This can be frustrating and time consuming. So when I write, I want the main idea of what I'm trying to communicate to be as clear as possible. To make it easier for my readers, I include a section that explicitly summarizes the book into one simple concept. For example, in my first book, Two Second Lean, the goal was to teach the reader to learn to see waste. In my second book, Lean Health, I wanted you to treat your body like you would treat a Ferrari. With lean travel, I want to show you how to travel light with a full heart. In addition to summarizing the entire book with one phrase, I put a simple to the point summary at the end of every chapter called The One Thing. It is a phrase that captures the essence of the chapter. Feel free to skip ahead and read The One Thing first before you even read the chapter. Whatever works best for you. The important thing is that you can easily and quickly understand what it is I'm trying to say. Enjoy the read. Preface, travel light with a full heart. Sitting in a breakfast area at a resort in Phuket, Thailand, I noticed that all the other guests were eating, talking with friends, or working on their phones, paying little attention to the amazing people taking care of them. Absorbed in their own lives, they didn't bother to acknowledge the people keeping their food fresh, picking up the plates, offering to refill the glasses, and cleaning up after them as they left. As they finished, most people walked away without even a glance to say thank you. For some reason, I found it easy to put myself in the worker's shoes that day. I was humbled by the thought that most of them had woke up very early in the morning to make sure everything was ready for us. How nice it would have been for someone just to smile at them and say thank you. Over the years, I've concluded that there are two kinds of people in the world, givers and takers. Takers are always looking to extract whatever they can from life and are less interested in what they can contribute. They are self-absorbed. They only care about themselves. Givers, on the other hand, are actively thinking about other people. Givers live by the idea that you first give and then you may receive. 
In my opinion, it is much better to be a giver than a taker. About 10 years ago, I decided that I wanted to become a world-class giver who surrounded myself with other world-class givers and to get all takers the hell out of my life as quickly as possible. Yes, you heard me right. That's exactly what I said. Get them the hell out of my life. Since then, I've successfully done this and the quality of my life has improved dramatically. Now, everywhere I go, people ask me, Paul, why are you doing what you're doing? You spend so much time helping other people learn about lean and improve their organizations, and you ask for so little in return. The answer is simple. I understand the power of being a giver. And in order to have a rich life, you must first learn to give. At this point, you might be thinking, why are you telling me this at the beginning of a book called Lean Travel? The reason is quite simple. In order to have a great travel experience, you must approach it from the standpoint that you are going to treat all the people you encounter with dignity and respect, understanding that they are working hard to help you have a great trip. If you regularly give them your respect, your smile, your encouragement, and your gratitude, your travel will be a blessing. In addition to being grateful, Another way to make your travel experience more fulfilling is to live by the adage, less is more. In a lean travel context, this means to travel light. For example, I once bought a pair of high-quality Keen sandals, thinking that they would be the ultimate travel sandal. After a few trips around the world, however, I realized they were really quite bulky and heavy. They were also a little bit of an overkill for when I needed sandals, which was mostly for walking to the hotel pool or to the restaurant for breakfast. So in adherence to my philosophy of traveling light, I found a very inexpensive pair of sandals for $5, and I turned in my $70 pair of Keens. This is a perfect example of lean travel because it demonstrates how a simple, two-second improvement can make travel more effective and enjoyable. My suitcase weighs about four pounds less, everything packed up much easier, and the new sandals were absolutely perfect for my needs. As you start this book, I want you to understand the two main points of my lean travel philosophy. First, what you give and the fullness of your heart towards the people you encounter on your travel experience will have a profound impact on how you enjoy your travel. Secondly, the less you bring and the lighter you travel, the more you'll be able to feel and adapt to the fantastic trade winds of the travel experience. So travel light with a full heart. The one thing, be a world-class giver. Surround yourself with givers and get all the takers the hell out of your life as fast as you can. Acknowledgements, editors, Leanne Akers, my wife, and Lori Turley, my assistant. Now, in the past, I've used editors to help me with my books, but not this time. I went directly to the source, the people that know me the best, to edit my words and make sure the meaning was exactly what I wanted it to be. And this saved a whole lot of overprocessing. This process was even more lean than my first two books, and I'm so happy because I'm always applying lean to everything. Graphics and book layout, Jamie Newberry, the graphic designer at FastCap, my company. Jamie's awesome, and she's always very flexible and willing to adjust to all the crazy things that I throw at her. Thanks, Jamie. You did a great job on this book. Special thanks. In my second book, Lean Health, I mentioned how my great friend and Brazilian beauty, Paloma, challenged me to make no excuses and to start writing Lean Health immediately. Now, only a few months after publishing Lean Health, Sarah Bailey, the wife of the witty Brit Ashley Bailey, assumed the role Paloma had taken and said in a Facebook post, Paul, you need to write Lean Travel. Without even giving me a few seconds to digest this crazy thought, the ever-annoying Ashley, her husband, also typed, no excuses, buddy. You need to get Lean Travel written and published by my birthday, May 17th. I asked him, are you kidding because I was way too busy to add another thing to my plate since May 17th was only six months away. 
However, it seemed that every time I'd say I'm too busy or that something can't be done, I was confronted with my own words that I give other people. Stop making excuses. Ashley is not a girl, so he definitely lacks some of the persuasive powers that Paloma and Sarah have. But he is a competent businessman and fellow lean maniac, as well as a close friend who can be a real pain in my butt, particularly when he threatens me with consequences if I don't get something done by his birthday. The details of that threat will go unsaid for the time being, but perhaps they will be revealed someday in one of my future musings. So Ashley and Sarah, this book would have never happened without you. Sarah, thank you for the nudge. And Ashley, thank you for kicking my ass. I mean, inspiring me. Intro, a quick look at lean thinking. In my first book, Two Second Lean, I wrote about how I learned to build a fun, continuously improving lean culture in my company, FastCap. To make lean more accessible to everyone, I simplified the lean principles of continuous improvement. After successfully implementing lean at FastCap, I shared what we had learned with others. Thousands of companies and managers worldwide wanted to learn a simplified way of implementing lean. The simple ideas that I laid out in Two Second Lean helped them run and manage their organizations at a much higher level. In these companies, tens of thousands of employees are more engaged as they go about their work each day. They do a better job of serving their customers and constantly improving their products, all while reducing costs, increasing profits and wages, and creating greater job security in a team environment where everyone wins. Taking the same lean principles and applying them to my health was the inspiration for my second book. Lean Health tells the story of how I achieved exceptional health by treating my body like a Ferrari. I was an average, overweight, 54-year-old man who transformed himself into a high-performance machine. After the transformation, I looked like I could be on the cover of Men's Health magazine. By applying daily small improvements over a one-year period, I refined and simplified the process of managing my health eliminated the waste in my diet and my exercise regime, and turned my life clock back 20 years. My third book, Lean Travel, is about how I tamed the struggle of travel. In this book, I will show you how I applied lean principles in a new way in order to improve every aspect of the travel experience. One of the main goals of lean is to identify and eliminate waste. Most people tolerate a great deal of waste when they travel. They wait in lines at the ticket counter and at security, which forces them to arrive much earlier than their departure time. They wait to pick up their luggage, which does not always arrive when it's supposed to. They continue to wait more at the rental car counter as the attendant slowly works through the line of customers, clicking through the options on their screens and trying to upsell the drivers on higher fees and unnecessary extra purchases. As a lean thinker, I view these wastes as beautiful opportunities to improve my life. I want perfection when I travel, and though I know it will never be perfect... I will get much closer than most people think is possible. I want my travel experience to be focused on learning and meeting people and not distracted by the clunky mechanics of getting somewhere. I do this because I am passionate about travel. I have been to 60 countries and have the goal of traveling to 100 countries by the age of 65. I am an instrument rated pilot and have flown my own plane across the North Atlantic multiple times. I've landed at hundreds of airports all over the world and have seen sides of travel that most people don't even know exist, from private FBOs, fixed-based operators catering to corporate aircraft of the rich and famous, to landing on dirt runways in Africa. Before you dismiss me as some rich guy who can afford the things that most cannot, I recently sold my airplane and now travel only commercially, and 90% is in economy class. I book all my own travel arrangements. I don't have a travel agent or assistant managing my crazy travel schedules. I travel about six months of the year and commonly take trips that last between two weeks and two months. 
This book charts my journey of continually improving the way I travel. It describes how I think about leaning out the processes of travel and continue to improve it every day, every leg, every hotel check-in, and every trip I make. I have worked hard to simplify every aspect of travel and remove the mountains of waste so my travel experience can be pure joy. In order to lean out your travel and simplify everything you do, you must have a deep understanding of the eight wastes. The eight wastes are number one, overproduction, number two, transportation, number three, inventory, number four, defects, number five, overprocessing, six, motion, seven, waiting, and eight, wasted human potential. Here is a quick example of how the eight wastes manifest themselves in the travel experience using a very common travel item, soap. Overproduction. When we check into a hotel, our rooms have a little bar of soap in the sink and another one in the shower. During our stay, between washing our hands and bathing ourselves, we might use 10% of the soap the hotel has provided. As a result, the hotel has to purchase much more soap than is actually necessary for its customers. Transportation. Billions of mini soap bars are used all over the world each year, which means that a lot of unnecessary transportation is needed to move it all. The waste of transporting the soap to the hotel and then to the garbage can, the dumpster, and then to the landfill really adds up. Adding to this is the transportation waste of the D9 Caterpillar that runs back and forth burying mountains of overproduced soap at the landfills as well as the transportation of the fuel and the maintenance vehicles that service the D9 Caterpillar. Inventory. In addition to the excess soap inventory being held and managed in the landfills around the world, hotels must deal with the abundance of soap in supply rooms. Managing this excess soap inventory is waste. Defects. The soap leaves scum on the sink and on the tiny tray in the shower. The resulting mess is a defect that requires the housekeeping staff to do extra work. Overprocessing. Waste begets more waste, and now we're adding things to the travel process that have nothing to do with why the product process was originally put in place. The purpose of providing soap is so that guests can clean and sanitize their hands and avoid spreading germs, not to create mountains of motion and inventory because someone was not thoughtful about the way they set up the process in the first place. Motion. The entire process of managing these little bars of soap produces mountains of waste and motion. From getting the bars of soap from the supply room into the cleaning cart, to moving the cleaning cart to the room, to retrieving the unused bars and throwing them in the trash can, and then emptying the trash can, the list goes on and on. Waiting. I can't tell you the number of times I've checked into a hotel early around 10 a.m. and have been told my room will not be ready until 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because the management has made the housekeeping staff perform silly procedures that have no value for the customers. Example, moving tiny bars of soap around. And because management can't see the waste in what they're asking their team to perform every day. Wasted human potential. This is the greatest waste of all. When you have a human being that's capable of so much more and you make them do mundane, repetitive, stupid work, like managing excess soap, instead of teaching them to use their brain to continuously improve, the hotel staff members are dealing with soap when they could be dealing with more important work. This is the worst tragedy and the biggest of all the eight wastes, and it happens all over the world millions of times every day. You should care because you're paying for that waste. Whether you like it or not, nobody works for free. Hotels just pass the cost of their stupidity on to you. If by chance you're someone who thinks that's part of the privilege of traveling is to open up a new little bar of soap every day, then there's nothing I can do for you. But let me tell you this, waste is not elegant or glamorous. Waste is ignorance. In addition to showing you how I travel, this book will give you the tools and understanding to make lean travel something that is fun and easy for you to do. 
No matter what your lot in life is, being born into this generation during this time period is the greatest gift that any human being could ever have. Opportunities are endless, and the world is open for business. Countries like Burma, China, Cambodia, Cuba, Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, places Westerners used to avoid, are today wide open and for the most part welcoming. They have fantastic historical sites and the full spectrum of accommodations and cheap hotels to five-star resorts. Come along. We have a world to discover and amazing friends to make along the way. By the way, most of the waste involved with those little mini bars of soap could be solved with either of these two easy solutions. First, Hotels could put liquid soap dispensers on the sink and in the shower. The customer would use only what they needed. The dispensers could be designed to clearly indicate when they are running low so the housekeeping staff could refill them only when necessary. Already, I'm seeing this more and more in hotels around the world, particularly in Asia, where people realize that resources are finite and they had better figure out a way to use them more efficiently. Secondly, travelers could solve this problem themselves. I have a small little soap container that I put one of these little mini bars of soap in. When I check into the hotel, I simply open my shaving kit and I have my own personal mini bar of soap that lasts me for a couple weeks. That's a 1400% improvement over the current system. The one thing, being wasteful is not glamorous. It is the epitome of ignorance. Chapter 1. Lean Travel is Remarkable Travel Lean travel is remarkable travel. Why? It is easy, rewarding, and almost always stress-free. Lean travel helps you create the kind of travel experience that when people look at the way you do things, they say, wow, that's cool. How do you do that? I tell them, it's not complicated. All you have to do is continuously improve everything you do and apply lean principles to the way you travel. As a lean thinker, I have greatly improved my life with one very simple idea, one that even a four-year-old could understand. Everything in life is a process. Think about it. Making your bed, brushing your teeth, managing your emails, paying your bills, shopping for groceries, washing your clothes, cutting your grass, traveling are all processes. Each one of these activities has a starting point and a completion point with several steps in between. When doing any of them, you encounter waste that doesn't add value to what you're trying to accomplish. For example, let's say it's laundry day at your home and it's your turn to wash the clothes. As you start a load, you reach down in the cabinet to pick up the detergent bottle, screw off the cap, set it on the edge of the machine, pour a little in, replace the cap, dribbling a little on the edge of the machine in the process, put the bottle back in the cabinet, close the door. You reach up, adjust the load settings, and finally start the machine. You're not done yet, though. You still must wipe up the spilled soap with a towel and toss it in the laundry to be washed with the next loads. Of all those steps, the only value-added one is putting the soap into the machine, which should take a total of three seconds. Everything else is non-value-added activity. Waste. There is plenty of wasted motion, bending down and up and down, unnecessary transportation of the soap to and from the cabinet, over-processing, taking off the cap and replacing it, and the defect, the spill, that robs you of 10 seconds of your precious time on earth without getting your clothes any cleaner. What could you do to simplify this process? At my 92-year-old mother's home, my solution was to put the laundry soap on a shelf right above the washing machine. The bottle has a little button you push to let the soap come out into the cap and doubles as a small measuring cup. Previously, my mom used this cup for every laundry load. She would pour soap into it, walk over to the machine, dump the soap in, then go back and place the cap next to the detergent. With the soap now above the washer, my mother could remove the cup from the process by opening the washer door, pushing the button, and counting to three. Voila! A process that took her 20 seconds 
now takes her three, and she doesn't have to worry about spilling or dropping the measuring cup. When people see how my mom washes her clothes, they comment how it's really smart. Indeed, lean is really smart, and it makes it surprisingly easy to improve processes if you apply a little common sense and a few basic principles. So much of what you do in life is a process, and every seemingly insignificant process contains some degree of waste. For example, I'm writing this book on my Mac. And as I finish each chapter, I let the text-to-speech feature read it back to me so I can hear the cadence of my words. The usual process for making this happen has four steps. Highlight the text, right-click, select Speak, then select Speak Text. With my big hands, it can sometimes be a little bit of a struggle to do this without making a mistake and having to repeat the entire process. Each time I mess up, I am wasting a few seconds of my valuable time, and even more important, I get a tiny bit agitated. For the love of God, don't get Paul agitated. After bungling the steps about 30 times, I finally decided to improve the process. I went into settings, created a shortcut, so all I have to do to enable the text-to-speak function is to hit Command S. It's so simple, and it works perfectly every time. I took a process that was four seconds with a high probability of making an error and shortened it to one second and made it nearly error-free. That is at least a 400% improvement thanks to one small change. Writing this book will go more smoothly, there will be fewer defects in the final editing process, and I get the satisfaction of making yet another improvement in my life. When you can stack small improvements up like this day after day, you begin to see why I'm a lean fanatic. They help my life get better every single day. You can do the same thing with travel. When you go somewhere, you deal with so many processes that could be improved. Imagine preparing for a trip, either in your own country or perhaps somewhere far away. So much goes into getting ready, dreaming about the trip, researching, planning, booking flights, finding a hotel, figuring out where to go and how much time to spend at each place, updating passports, visas, deciding which clothes to take, planning and communicating with the people you will meet on the other side of the world, getting to the airport, going through security, enduring flight delays, navigating unfamiliar airports and transportation systems, finding restaurants, tipping, the list goes on and on and on. With so many different variables, there are many opportunities for things to get fouled up but there are at least as many opportunities to create your own small improvements. This is why I'm excited about lean travel. It leads to remarkable experiences by removing the waste from the processes affecting your travel. As you learn how to do it, you will have more time to get that perfect picture, to sip that fantastic cappuccino in some cozy coffee shop in Portugal, to take that beautiful walk on the beach by your hotel in Costa Rica, or to learn the salsa at a dance studio hidden among the cobblestone streets of Havana. Lean travel leads to less misunderstandings fewer missed flights, and more, thank God I have some extra time to go see those amazing historical site moments. Applying lean thinking to travel makes so much sense and makes everything so much better. The goal to consider every step you take while traveling as a process to be improved. The results will put a smile on your face that changes your travel experience and your life forever. The one thing, Everything in life is a process. Make small daily improvements and your life will be remarkable. Chapter 2. My Warped Perspective on Travel Around 2005, I began to travel quite extensively for my company. Every time I turned around, I found myself walking into an airport, waiting for a plane to take off, or dealing with flight delays. I'm an impatient person to begin with. But having to deal with the flight schedules and all the issues surrounding travel frustrated me to no end. To further complicate things, I lived in Bellingham, Washington, a small town whose airport has only a few outbound flights each day. All of my trips had to go through Seattle, which added three to four hours to the length of every trip. 
If I drove to Seattle, it cost me two hours of road time plus the expense of parking. Then, if I happened to return late at night, I was faced with another two-hour drive while being drop-dead tired. Flying to Seattle didn't save much time either, because I had to get to the airport an hour early for every flight. One day, I stopped at a convenience store in the Seattle airport to look at something to read, and picked out a magazine called Flying. On the front cover was this amazing-looking airplane called a jet prop, next to a headline that said, Business or Pleasure? One of the articles inside compared flying from Seattle to Southern California in a private plane versus flying on a commercial airline. The author said it was just as fast to take your own plane as it was to fly commercially. I was a bit skeptical about the claim at first, but after reading the whole article, I realized I could benefit from having my own plane. Since Bellingham is only a half-hour flight from Seattle, I could save a few hours on nearly every business trip and also cut out some of the clunky mechanics of traveling commercially. I spent the rest of the trip to Southern California, coincidentally, thinking about the possibility of becoming a pilot. After a year of researching the pros and cons of owning a plane, I decided to pull the trigger and get my pilot's license. Soon afterwards, I bought my first plane, a Diamond DA-40. A year and a half later, I bought the plane of my dreams, a jet prop similar to the one on the magazine cover. The turbine aircraft could fly at 28,000 feet and almost 300 miles an hour. Soon I was jetting all over the United States and Europe, logging thousands of hours behind the controls of my new plane. In those days, flying your own aircraft made a lot of sense. Many of my distributors were in small communities scattered across the United States, and it was convenient to fly directly to nearby regional airports that weren't serviced by commercial airlines. Over the next 10 years, I spent a lot of time flying myself around, never needing to schedule an airline ticket or worry about whether there was a connecting flight to some obscure airport. The convenience was great, but it came with a high price tag. It was expensive to learn to fly and to maintain two aircraft. Another big expense was bringing a professional pilot along with me much of the time, just to make sure I did everything right. The kind of flying I was doing was very complex. It was not unusual for me to fly to five states in one day. My entire foray into private aviation served me well, but about a year ago, I decided to sell my planes. While I certainly enjoyed having them and all the experiences they provided me, I now reflect back on that time period and realize I had a warped perspective on travel. I used to think about commercial travel as nothing but a long list of inconveniences, crowded seats, bad food, flight delays, etc. Today, though, I feel entirely different about it because I have learned lean and know how to eliminate waste in everything. Travel has become pure joy for me. When I have to go somewhere, I look forward to traveling commercially. In fact, I now see commercial travel as better than private because I don't have to manage an aircraft, an aviation department, or anything else. I can just leave all that to the pros who have a much better safety track record than I could ever accomplish. Even though I had no accidents or any problems, the training of a professional pilot far surpasses that of a private pilot. When I go to the airport and have to wait a couple hours for a plane to take off, I'm no longer frustrated. I'm happy to have more time to get things done, like writing, answering emails, or communicating with friends. Even making travel arrangements is fun now. I'm able to plan an entire trip using tools that are available to anyone. I use TripAdvisor to find out what the best hotels and local attractions are in the city that I'm going to visit. I use Google Earth to zoom in on the exact area where I'm staying so I have a mental picture of it before I ever leave home. I use Expedia to book all my travels. Just click, 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 and I'm done. Before we continue, I want to ask you, is your perspective on travel warped? Do you have a degree of angst about the whole process? Are there things that bother you about it? If so, I would suggest that, like I once did, you have a weak understanding of how to navigate the system successfully so you can enjoy it from beginning to end. But don't worry. The purpose of this book is to show you how to continuously improve your travel experience using lessons I have learned through years of being on the road.
Throughout this book, I'm going to share terms that are common to lean manufacturing and give you examples to help you become a lean thinker so that you can apply the principles to every aspect of your life, including travel. Here are a few. One piece flow. One piece flow means to focus on one task at a time without putting anything off or letting work accumulate. When the flight attendant hands you the customs form, don't stuff it in the pouch in the front of the seat and then later panic when the plane has landed and you have to pull it out and get it all done as everyone's leaving the plane. Do it now. To be even more efficient, it helps to memorize your passport number and flight number so you don't have to jockey around trying to find the information. Batch work. Batch work is the opposite of one piece flow. When you say, I'll get to that later, and put each task on a to do list, you create a batch work for yourself. Essentially, you accumulate a whole bunch of things to do at a later time, which makes it harder to complete them. If you wait too long, you can't remember all the details, which means you have to spend a whole bunch of time going back and collecting the information that you had at your fingertips when you first received it. Managing all this is over-processing. Single Minute Exchange of Dyes In the lean world, SMED, or Single Minute Exchange of Dye, means to change a dye or machine out in a few minutes so that you don't have to make large batches. With lean travel, SMED requires making sure it is easy to change between tasks so you do not put them off until a later date. For example, when I started writing this book, I was using both my computer and my iPhone to type it. However, I noticed I was regularly putting off writing because my computer dictation function was harder to use than my iPhone's. Dictation was easy on my iPhone, but the editing was difficult because the font was very small. I didn't have the best eyesight. I preferred to use the iPhone because it was easy to keep at hand and was also very versatile. I could more easily switch between tasks such as answering emails, banging out a chapter in the book, or booking a flight reservation. The solution turned out to be simple. I increased the font size in the Pages app on my iPhone, and before long, I was doing everything on the phone. Problem solved. This is a classic example of single minute exchange of dies. I was exchanging my workflow from one thing to another very simply because I improved the processes. When you really get into this lean thinking, you'll find out that it applies to everything you're doing in life. Now I'm going off script here a little bit, but that is why I'm a lean fanatic because these principles that typically apply to manufacturing actually have great application to everything you do, and especially the way you travel. Standardization. By using standardized processes, you remove the burden from everything you do and make your work more productive and more effective. In this case, I standardized my work so I could use my iPhone for 98% of the processes that I performed every day as opposed to jockeying back and forth between the laptop and the iPhone. Muda or waste. I mentioned the eight wastes of lean in the introduction, and we'll talk about these more as we go along. The first and most important waste is overproduction, which is when we make too much of something. If you create excess product, it is cumbersome to manage it. Packing too much stuff for a trip is an example of overproduction when we travel. We carry so many things we really don't need, and it just encumbers the entire system. We will talk about a lot of other terms throughout the course of this book, and you'll start to see how understanding lean manufacturing and becoming a lean thinker is highly relevant to travel. So let's get started. The one thing, for the love of God, understand your weaknesses and distortions and turn them into your strengths. Chapter three, less is more. The secret to lean travel is this, less is more, and lighter is better. I remember sitting down to dinner about 10 years ago with a friend of mine from the East Coast, listening to one of his travel stories. He said that when he went to China and checked into the hotel, he spent the first two hours unpacking his bags and rearranging everything inside. As he told me this, I wondered how it managed to get unarranged. Wasn't it just sitting in a suitcase the whole time? 
He wasn't happy because he could have used those two hours to do more interesting things. Most people encounter the same issues when they travel. They bring too much stuff, which means they have to spend a lot of time sifting through it and trying to stay organized. They end up wasting time when they could be out enjoying their destination. A much simpler solution than repacking everything would be to bring less stuff in the first place. Anderson Cooper, the world-renowned reporter, inspired me to travel lightly. He was asked in an interview how it was that he was able to travel all over the world so efficiently. He said the key is to travel light. I only take a few things with me and I seem to be able to manage everywhere I go. Waste is everywhere in the travel experience, just as it is in manufacturing. If we compare the two, carrying too much stuff is like overproduction. It leads to many other problems. In a factory, when you produce too many goods, you have to manage all your excess inventory, moving it around, finding storage spaces, creating complex inventory control systems, etc. And it's all waste. When you travel with too many things, you need a bigger suitcase, which takes extra time to fill. You have to check the bag instead of carrying it onto the plane, and then you have to wait at the baggage carousel to pick it up. The excess items lead to overprocessing, motion, waiting, and some wasted human potential, yours. Because now you're sitting there with herds of people waiting to get your bag instead of writing your next book, answering an email, or communicating with friends. Over the years, I've learned a couple tricks that can help you overcome your tendency to bring too many things. First, stop packing as if you're going to have an emergency and start packing like your trip is going to go off without a hitch. If you travel with an optimistic outlook, you won't feel the need to carry every possible remedy for every possible bad situation. Second, don't be afraid to wear the same things more than once during a trip. Most clothes can be worn multiple times without any problem. If you're worried about what people think of you, don't. Most of the time, it's highly unlikely that you'll see the same people over and over again. And even if you do, most people really could care less about what you're wearing. Most people are so preoccupied with how they themselves look. They aren't paying as much attention to you as you think. One of the best lessons I've learned about traveling is how few clothes I actually need. In the past, if I was going to be gone for five days, I would bring five days worth of clothes. For a seven-day trip, seven days worth. When I needed to travel for two weeks, it seemed like I was hauling everything but the kitchen sink with me. It was total insanity. I always ended up lugging around a bunch of dirty laundry too, and no one wants to do that. If I'm in a situation and I need a couple of extra shirts because I feel like people are going to start noticing I'm wearing the same thing over and over again, I just purchase a new one. 30 or 40 bucks for a dress shirt. The convenience of lighter luggage is worth the cost, especially since I rarely need to buy new clothes. Now I know a lot of women are reading this chapter right now and saying, that's easy for you to say, you're not a woman. You know what? I've seen many women travel with suitcases as light as mine because they know that carrying loads of stuff around is not worth it. Being free and light is easy and makes traveling much better. The truth is you don't need more than five days worth of clothes on almost any trip. If you're worried about the people you meet on your business trip being judgmental about your clothes, don't. I regularly deal with some very exclusive high-end people and no one has ever said anything to me yet. Your outerwear, dress shirts, and pants really shouldn't get that dirty. They can easily go two or three, even five days without being washed. I found that the trick is to wear a lightweight nylon shirt underneath the dress shirts, which keeps the dress shirt from getting sweaty or soiled. For me, the magic number to make things lighter is three. I take three pairs of dress socks, three undershirts, and three pairs of underwear. In addition, I take one pair of dress shoes, one pair of running shoes, and a pair of sandals. Three pairs of shoes to deal with nearly any situation that could come up. I also bring five dress shirts and a pair of running socks. One of the best ways to extend the length of your clothes is to wash them yourself. 
It isn't very complicated. You fill the sink with hot water, add a little shampoo or a travel pack of laundry detergent, scrub the clothes, rinse them out, and hang them over a chair outside on the balcony. Hanging them over a lampshade also works well because the heat from the lampshade dries them out quickly. It only takes a few minutes to wash my undergarments, and I just press and iron the other stuff as needed so I can look absolutely perfect. This one trick alone has allowed me to pack so much lighter than I ever dreamed. If you're not predisposed to doing your own laundry in the sink, have the hotel do it. Or if you want to save some money, take it to a nearby laundry. There are lots of places around the world where you can get your laundry done very cheaply. For example, in Thailand, about $5 you can get a whole week's worth of laundry done. Certain brands of clothes are more suitable for travel than others. One of my favorites is Ex Officio a high-quality outdoor brand. ex officio clothes are a little expensive, $80 to $100 for a shirt and around $80 for a pair of pants, but they are durable, lightweight, and dry quickly when wet. The company also has invented underwear so good that some guy traveled all the way around the world with two pair of underwear for a whole year. I carry three pair for me. The colder destinations, I have a Patagonian coat that is very lightweight and it looks sharp too. It fits easily in my backpack and keeps me warm in the coldest of climates. When I go outside in Kazakhstan and it's 20 degrees below, the jacket is adequate to get me to and from the car. Even if I go hiking in it, the jacket hood provides good protection from most weather conditions I encounter. The one problem with these brands is that they cost more than you might typically spend on clothing. This is where you have to make an important choice. Would you rather spend $250, the price of a Patagonia jacket, and have a high-quality, portable product that's going to last? Or would you rather spend less money, take two or three of something, and have to manage them for the entire trip? If you want to simplify your travel, you choose the first option. This is off script a little bit. If there's one lesson that I wish I would have learned when I was young, is it's all about quality. If I would have bought the best quality clothes when I was 22 years old and just starting out, I would not have replaced the clothes that I did buy three and four times because I wasn't satisfied with wearing them after just two or three times. But I buy one great piece of clothing and I want to wear it over and over again. And every time I reach into my closet, I say, ah, I want to wear that. Quality is much less expensive than thinking you're getting a bargain by buying something cheap. One of the most important lessons I've ever learned. Back on script. While clothes are a major contributor to overpacking, they are not the only one. Travelers often carry too much electronic gear, especially cameras. We tell ourselves we need every type of camera to get the perfect shot. I completely understand. If anybody likes to carry a lot of camera gear, it's me. I'm a photographer, a videographer, and a drone enthusiast. In the past, everywhere I went, I would bring my video camera, my fast cam, my action cam, my GoPro, the iPhone camera, and a 35 millimeter camera. My bags were heavy. Now, because camera technology has advanced so far, I get away with just bringing my iPhone for snapshots and my ground-based video work. The only other camera I take with me is my drone, a DJI Phantom 4. Of course, now I'm graduated up to the Mavic, and by the time you read this book or listen to it, I'm probably going to be on the next drone that's the latest and greatest. Back to script. I love drones because it allows me to get some spectacular footage of the places I visit. Carrying a drone can be a challenge, but it is very manageable too. I used to bring a large specialized backpack for it, but I figured out how to eliminate the waste of packing. I could fit it inside a normal backpack along with the rest of my stuff. Now I only bring one backpack and a carry-on suitcase with me. And believe it or not, I have my drone with me all in that small compact packing configuration. It's really amazing when you start to use your mind about how to lean everything out. Wherever you travel, think less is more. Think about eliminating waste when you pack and use the tips above to extend the use of what you're carrying with you. If you do, your satisfaction will be much greater and you'll be surprised how little you need. Give it a try. And you'll be shocked at how much simpler, smoother, and more rewarding your travel will be. The one thing, 
Stop planning for an emergency and start planning for success. Chapter 4, Debacle in Dubai Because I've learned to travel with fewer things, no matter where I'm traveling or how long I'm going to be away, I only bring a backpack and a roll-around suitcase to carry onto the plane. With only those two pieces of luggage to manage, life on the road is quite simple. But the minute I add something to that, trouble seems to follow closely behind, at least when it comes to luggage. My first bag debacle happened when my wife and I went on safari to South Africa. Well, there we found a store that had some beautiful hand-embroidered pillowcases and a lot of other unique items that Leanne wanted to buy as Christmas gifts for her family. By the time she'd finished shopping, we had somewhere around $1,000 worth of gifts in a nicely packed gift bag. It was great to get some of our Christmas shopping done, but it also gave us an extra bag to carry the rest of the trip. While traveling back to the States, Leanne managed the extra bag from South Africa to Dubai. In Dubai, I offered to carry it around the airport while we waited for our next flight. When it was time to board the plane, I set the bag down and reached into my pocket to get my passport and ticket out. Because I was not used to carrying the third bag, it slipped my mind that I had set it down and I walked to the plane without it. A few minutes later, as I was putting my things in the overhead bin, I realized what I had done. I ran back up the gangway as fast as I could, but by the time I got to the ticket counter, the bag was gone. No one had seen it. I felt terrible. It wasn't just that I'd lost the bag. It was that I had lost the bag that my wife had entrusted in me that was filled with Christmas gifts. Breaking her trust hurt more than losing the actual objects. Unfortunately, I did something similar three years later. I was at the Madrid airport looking for a gift for my friend Asel, who I was going to visit in Portugal. I saw a store there that sold these fantastic bottles of olive oil. Asel likes to cook, and the oil would be the perfect gift. I told the man helping me that I would like to buy some, but the security probably would not let it on the plane. He said, it's no problem. We can pack it special and they will let you carry it on. I explained that a cell would also need to be able to check it on the airplane when she returned home to Belgium. Once again, he reassured me, as long as she doesn't open it, they will let you through security and she won't have any problem. With the special packaging, the bottle wouldn't fit into my backpack, so I had to carry them in a separate bag. That almost convinced me to not get the oil, but I really wanted to bring a cell a gift, so I bought it anyways. I should have known better. It didn't take me more than 10 minutes before I lost that olive oil. I went over to the gate, sat down, put it on the floor next to my suitcase, just like in Dubai. When they called for the final boarding, I sprang to my feet, grabbed my luggage, and walked off, leaving the olive oil right next to my chair where I was sitting. This time, I didn't even make it to the plane before I'd realized something was missing. I turned around, ran back up the gangway as fast as I could, but the oil was gone. I couldn't believe it. No more than four or five minutes had transpired and the bag was already gone. I chastened myself, Paul, you've learned your lesson. Three bags is a curse. The two debacles hammered home the idea for me that less is more. When I had only two bags, they were always linked together and it was very difficult to lose either of them. But the minute there was a third bag involved, the potential to lose something increased exponentially. I've learned that if you're going to buy something when you travel, it should fit into your suitcase or your backpack. Today, my single roll around suitcase plus the backpack that fits over the handle is my travel profile. This makes it much easier to negotiate the airports, airplanes, hotels, and rental cars. It is compact, easy to monitor, and nothing gets left behind. If you remember earlier, I said people often look at me and marvel, Paul, how do you travel with so little and do it so gracefully? The answer is simple. I follow the principle that less is more and stick to it. Another thing that helps me travel more smoothly is the understanding of source management. My good friend, Richie Oshingo, former president of Toyota China, explains source management this way. 
If you have a mighty river and you want to change its direction, trying to divert it at the mouth of the river where it meets the ocean would be very difficult. At that point, the river is big and wide and often the current is powerful. If, however, you go up into the mountains to where the river is just a small trickle of water, it is very easy just to move your foot a little to the left or right and change the direction of the entire river. With this source management, you look hard at your problems and go right to the place where they are created. In the example of losing the extra bag, what is truly the source of the problem? At the most fundamental level, it's the notion that possessions make people happy. Travelers tend to buy little Chotsky knickknacks and bring them home because they think people will really enjoy and appreciate them. I'm sure there are some who do, but most people just end up with shelves full of unwanted junk because people push these things on them. Understanding push and pull is important in this context as well. In lean manufacturing, we always want the customer to create demand or pull for a product. This eliminates overproduction, which causes all kinds of other problems. Likewise, when traveling, we never want to push anything on anyone. The minute we push, the waste stream goes crazy. Whether we are pushing these tchotchke gifts on our friends and family, or the airlines are pushing bad food on us when we are flying, so much of this stuff gets wasted. Love pull, hate push. The people you want to buy all these gifts for would be more pleased with regularly hearing from you, receiving a thoughtful picture via email or posted on Facebook, or following effective real-time journalizing of your trip so they could travel virtually with you and learn from your experiences. In other words, connecting with people is more important than piling things on them. For me, the source of the excess luggage problem is a misunderstanding of what's really important to people. When you reduce your material desires, you free yourself to connect with others on a more personal level. If you make it your top priority to connect and communicate with people and not load them up with junk, you can lessen the management burden of your travel too. Pursuing minimalism and keeping things as simple as possible has become an obsession for me. I can't count how many times I've traveled with people who bought an extra suitcase to haul their purchases home from a long trip. They spend more money on a suitcase they don't need and have to manage that extra suitcase throughout the duration of their trip. It costs more money to get the cheap crap home because they have to pay for an extra suitcase. The person receiving gifts has to take care of the gift and it clutters up their life until they get rid of it. Waste, waste, waste. The power of simplicity extends beyond travel, too. Recently, my assistant Lori and her husband sold their big house, got rid of 80% of their stuff, and moved into a small two-bedroom condominium. I asked her how she liked it, and her reply circles around in my mind every day. I love it! Every weekend, Keith and I decide what we're going to do instead of staying home and working on our house, cleaning and doing projects. We're actually enjoying life. I may seem cynical about giving gifts, but I have seen what most people actually do with these things. The vast majority of them are not appreciated, and all that stuff really adds up. A few years back, I received an insightful email from one of the listeners of my show, The American Innovator. Paul, have you ever thought about the real cost of poor quality? We fill stores with low-quality products that people buy because they are less expensive. The product gets used three or four times, and then they often underperform or flat-out fail. Then we relegate this stuff to our closets, garages, and storage lockers. We build bigger homes and more storage that cost more to heat and maintain. Our property taxes go up, the time it takes to clean them out goes up, and the very thing we want, happiness, is sucked up by all the additional managing of all our stuff. Once a year, we clean our house and throw and give away all the stuff we thought would make us happy. The vast majority of the stuff 
ends up in the landfill that we have to manage with big, heavy equipment and scientific testing to make sure we're not contaminating the environment. If that's not enough, then we have to consider the cost of all the materials and resources that went into making all that stuff in the first place. Then the cost of transporting low quality products to the store, then to our homes, to the Goodwill, and then to the landfill. The entire real cost of all the low quality products versus an expensive product or high quality product is staggering. In most cases, you could purchase a high quality product for a fraction of the cost of a low quality one. What an insightful email. His words helped me see how I confused the accumulating material goods with spiritual satisfaction. Thankfully, I'm learning to think differently. It is much better to give people something that will have lasting meaning. For me, that something has been the stories I tell in my videos to inspire others to explore the world for themselves and the books that I write. The best example I can think of comes from something I did for a cell. When I visited her in Portugal, after I forgot the olive oil, over four days she took me around and showed me all the sights and sounds of beautiful Lisbon. Unbeknownst to her, the entire time I was discreetly taking short video clips of what we had been doing with my iPhone. In the evenings, I put the clips together to create a video highlighting the wonderful things we experienced together. The last thing I needed was the right music. On the last day of the trip, a cell came downstairs to my bedroom, knocked on the door, and sat on the edge of my bed with her computer. She asked me if I'd ever heard Ed Sheeran's song, Photographs. She clicked on her laptop and played me the video. I began to cry because it was the most beautiful song I'd ever heard. The video depicted Ed's life from when he was a baby through his rise to stardom, using the pictures and video clips his parents had taken over the years. Clearly, this song was meaningful to us cell. And I thought that if I put the photographs from the trip to this song, it could really highlight how special the four days had been for both of us. I finished making the photo video montage and gave it to a cell right before I left. Needless to say, it was emotional and meaningful for her. To this day, we still talk about it. It so perfectly captured the moments that neither of us ever wanted to forget. Sure, the olive oil would have been a nice gift, but the four-minute music video is something that will help us cherish those memories for the rest of our lives. There was no package to open. There was no waste. Just a simple click on her phone and the music began to play. Be thoughtful when you travel and avoid your own baggage debacle by limiting yourself and what you bring with you. Don't let your presence and your ability to emotionally connect with people on a daily basis be masked with materialism. You will simplify not only your life, but your travel as well. The one thing, go to the source of the problem. Solve problems at the source and your burdens will be light. Less is more. Chapter 5 just in time travel. Most people believe that to get good flights and hotels at a reasonable price, you have to plan way in advance. I always used to think that too, but in the last year, I've learned it's not always the case. If you're planning a great vacation for your family, you probably need some predictability in how you plan and organize your trip. But if you are spontaneously traveling all over the world, you have to frequently change and rearrange your travel plans. For people with this type of lifestyle, just-in-time travel is the way to go. With just-in-time travel, you arrange your travel as you go instead of planning it far in advance. Now, I rarely book hotel arrangements more than two weeks in advance, and I frequently even book them on the same day. You get the best deals at the last minute because a day, a week, or sometimes two weeks in advance, hotels look at their reservations and calculate when they will have extra rooms to fill. They contact sites like Expedia and offer them discounts to entice flexible customers like me to book with them. I am shocked when I reflect back on all the consternation I put myself through, thinking I needed to book in advance to get a room. 
By making reservations so early, all I did was make my schedule less adaptable to my ever-changing needs. The same principles apply to flight reservations. In the past, I always thought I needed to book way ahead of time or I just wouldn't get a seat. Not anymore. People's ability to access information and schedule flights online is much more fluid. So fewer travelers reserve their flights way in advance and planes are not booked full as early as they were in the past. My general rule of thumb for making flight reservations is to book them a week before I'm ready to go. For international flights, I will book two or three weeks in advance, but even that's not always necessary. I'm seeing amazing discounts on fares the same week as the flight. In fact, I recently flew to Germany one week before the flight. I visited Expedia and found a flight on Condor Airlines for $800 round trip. These kinds of deals exist just in time and at the last minute. You just have to be a little patient and understand the system. Use Expedia and other apps to get the best deals. Technology has made planning travel so much better, and Expedia has become my go-to resource for almost all my travel bookings. I'm often booking flights and hotels in under 60 seconds. I find the hotel, find the flight, and then it's click, click, done. The bookings are automatically added to my list of trips. I can review them anytime I want. I used to monitor all my reservations with an app called TripIt, but frankly, Expedia's travel log of trips is so effective and efficient that I don't use TripIt much anymore. When I'm booking international flights and I'm not familiar with the local carriers at my destination, I use an app called Skyscanner. A good friend of mine in Spain showed it to me. It scans all the airlines, including several of the ones that might not show up in search engines like Expedia or Kayak because they don't work with travel websites. Skyscanner allows you to know every possible flight available no matter how small or obscure the airline is. Once you determine that a particular carrier has the flight you need, you can go directly to that carrier's website and book it if it's not available through Expedia. The app from Alaska Airlines is also crazy good. Alaska Airlines flights do show up on Expedia, but sometimes I find it very convenient just to book directly with Alaska. The nice thing about these apps is they store my credit card information. So all I have to do is enter my social security code and I'm done with the reservation. Because I can make my own travel plans so quickly from my iPhone, I never have to explain them to my assistant, which saves me a lot of time and headaches and miscommunication. In lean terms, giving the assistant the explanation would be considered over-processing. You can go to my website, paulacres.net, and find out a plethora of information about how to travel smart, and all the links to all my favorite apps are there as well. Another benefit of just-in-time travel is that my plans change. I pay fewer cancellation fees than I used to. Expedia has an exceptional feature that if you book a flight, you have 24 hours to cancel it. Often, I think I found the perfect flight and I book it, but over the course of the next 24 hours, I decide it's not going to work out. With three clicks, the reservation is canceled and I'm done without any hassle. Sometimes I'll go to six or seven countries on a single trip and I used to worry about the ability of a website to handle multiple destinations. However, I learned a little secret. You don't want to do multiple destinations in the same booking because if anything changes, you screw up the entire reservation. When I recently went to Expedia to make a couple changes on a multi-city reservation, they told me it would cost $150 for each change. It was a nightmare. That's when it clicked. Why was I creating this big batch of flights? Why not do one-piece flow instead? In lean manufacturing, one-piece flow has been shown to be more efficient than batch work. When making flight plans now, I apply one-piece flow by only booking one leg at a time. That way, if my schedule changes at the last minute, I only have to rebook the one leg and pay for one penalty fee. Side note, the superior efficiency of one-piece flow is counterintuitive and most people don't believe it until they see it in action. The best way to contrast the two methods is to show people a three-minute demonstration of manufacturing paper airplanes. You start with two groups. One group makes airplanes by performing each fold separately on 10 sheets of paper before moving on to the next step in the process. That's batch processing. 
The other group makes complete airplanes from one piece of paper before moving on to the next step, one piece flow. At the end of three minutes, the different results are staggering. The group using batch processing has maybe one or two planes done, a bunch of work in process, and a bunch of material inventory that they have not touched. The team using one piece flow usually has eight or 10 planes completed, tested, and ready to fly. Batch work is less efficient because you have to manage all the parts repeatedly, stacking them, moving them, and revisiting them. You want to avoid the same thing when booking a reservation or planning your travel. Making them one at a time is the simplest way to do this. Additionally, if you book each leg completely independent, it is easier to organize your travel schedule. When you look at your trip's menu at the Expedia app, you can see all the different destinations. If you need to modify one, you just go to select that city you're flying to and modify only that one. You could argue that it's easier to let the travel companies figure out all the connection times for you, but frankly, it's easy to do by opening multiple tabs in your browser and clicking back and forth to check the connection times. There's nothing hard about figuring out connections, especially if you're not checking bags that have to be shuttled from airline to airline. When you check bags, you add complexity and the potential for defects. As we already discussed, if you travel with multiple carriers, you set yourself up for problems. Sometimes when you make a connection, an airline will check your bags through to another. But most of the time, if you switch carriers, you have to go outside of security, retrieve your bag from the luggage claim, and go back through the screening process. It's better to just carry it onto the plane yourself and avoid that ritual. The point of this book is to teach you about lean travel, which looks to eliminate waste in all the processes through continuous improvement. We must always be looking for ways to improve. The key is to be a little curious. If you ask questions, you'll be shocked at how much you'll learn. Whenever I'm traveling, I'm always talking to the people that I meet and asking them to share their tricks to travel more efficiently. Loey, a friend of mine who lives in China, told me about an app the Chinese use called Sea Trip. It is similar to Expedia, and I use it all the time when traveling in Asia because I can get better deals and more options than Expedia offers in those countries. One of my favorite examples of just-in-time travel is getting upgraded to business class. You can buy an upgrade at the list price when you book your flight, or you can wait until you get to the gate or even board the plane and ask if upgrades are available. When you wait, you'll pay a fraction of the cost. If I am taking an international flight that is eight hours or longer, I really try to get an upgrade to business class. I get a lot more done when I have more room to comfortably spread out, which leads to being more rested for work or play once I arrive. To improve my chances of getting the upgrade, I try to show up at the airport three or four hours before the flight. International flights typically open four hours before the takeoff time. And if you're the first in line, you have the best opportunity to check the price of a business class upgrade. The airlines will give you the best deal if you book the flight directly with them. But even if you don't, upgrades are often still available, so always ask. If you don't like the quoted price, try again. As I type these words, I'm at 36,000 feet en route from Santiago, Chile to Easter Island. I sit here fully stretched out in the emergency exit row on a beautiful 787 Dreamliner with more room than they have in first class. How did I pull this off? Persistence and experience. This is how it happened. My wife and I got to the checkout counter early and asked if the emergency exit row was available. The ticket agent said no. They were all full. So we asked for business class upgrades instead. She said they were $2,500 each and we would have to go upstairs to the ticket purchase counter if we wanted to buy them. We ran upstairs and the agent there confirmed they were $2,500 each. Unwilling to pay so much, we asked again for exit row seatings and were told to go to a different counter where someone might be able to help us. The first woman at the check-in counter had told us we were not eligible for emergency exit row because we did not speak Spanish. Being an experienced traveler, I knew it was rare that they used this criteria. I asked again at a third counter, as nicely as I could, throwing in as many Spanish words as I knew. 
The agent was very accommodating, and before long, we were tearing up our old tickets, which were terrible, and they handed us two emergency exit row seats that were fantastic. Score! As we walked away, I thought we should try to get exit row seating secured for the return trip three days later. So we circled back to the same counter and asked if we could book the same seats for the return flight. Shockingly, the answer was different yet again. This time, the agent said we could not book them. And even if we could, it would cost extra money. This was the same man who gave us the two upgrade tickets in under four minutes and never mentioned a word about charging us anything. He went on to say you could only do it 48 hours before the flight and you had to do it online. I asked him to please try one more time. He went into the computer and 60 seconds later, he booked the same seats for the return flight with no extra charge. The moral of the story is always be persistent. To give yourself the best chance to improve your seats on a flight, follow these steps. Ask for the emergency exit row because those seats disappear quickly. If one is available, you want the agent to immediately secure it for you in the system. Do not distract the agent with any other activity other than reserving your exit row seat. I have seen those seats disappear right in front of me because the agent was busy with something else. Two. If you cannot get an exit row seat, ask for the availability of a business class upgrade. If the price is reasonable, my threshold is $800, make a decision before moving to step three. If you strike out at the initial check-in counter, proceed to the gate and ask the same question again. You would be surprised how many times you will get a totally different answer. Four. If the answer you receive at the gate is not favorable, make sure you're the last one on the plane and ask the flight attendant as you board. Many times I've been quoted $2,000 at the check-in counter and then paid $500 for business class upgrades on the plane. Five, if you strike out a third time, never fear. As you board the plane, peruse the available seats on the plane and see if you can find a seat with an open seat next to it, or better yet, an exit row seat that has not been taken. You will not believe the number of times I've scored on major seats that are way more comfortable than was originally assigned to me just by being the last one on the plane. Only once in the last three years did one of these strategies not work for me. Persistence pays when it comes to booking hotels too. One of my favorite places in the world is Phuket, Thailand. I can go on and on about Phuket, the beautiful beaches, the warm water, the great food, the reasonable prices, the friendly people. Every time I go there, I try to find a place that is more affordable with a location that is more desirable. The last time I went, I was practicing just-in-time travel. So I only booked a hotel for one night of the 10-day visit. When I looked online, it seemed like a nice place, but not the kind of place I wanted to spend a week and a half. My first night stay confirmed that. The next morning, I woke up, rented a scooter for about five bucks, and drove around to 10 different hotels that, according to Expedia and TripAdvisor, had offered great values because I was doing just-in-time travel. After looking at nine of them, I was a little discouraged. Phuket was very busy this time of year, so there wasn't much available. Was my just-in-time system going to fail me? No. Just because most people were booked up didn't mean everyone was booked. Besides, the hotel where I was staying had rooms available if there were no other option. Finally, I pulled up in front of the 10th hotel and took a look. It was spectacular, with huge suite rooms, beautiful furnishings, elegant bathrooms, and five pools, and heavily discounted at only 60 bucks a night compared to the normal rate of $150 to $180 per night. To top it off, nobody was there. Just-in-time travel plus a little persistence paid off for me big time. Nestled neatly within the concept of just-in-time travel is the concept of the orientation day. When I'm traveling to a new location and I know I'm going to be there for three to five days, 
I often don't book anything until I take some time to become oriented with my surroundings. I call this the orientation day. Similar to how I checked out several hotels in Phuket, I used the first day of the trip to discover the ins and outs of a new destination. For example, we flew to Easter Island. I talked to the flight attendant, Catalina, and she told me all kinds of great things to do and see. She had been to Easter Island five times and had collected lots of local knowledge. Catalina's insights weren't my first exposure to Easter Island. A week earlier, I had begun watching YouTube videos online to understand what the island was all about. She even invited our group to a barbecue that the flight team was having at one of the best beaches on the island. Talk about having the inside track. Shortly after landing, we rented quads so we could track all over the island and get the lay of the land. Traversing the island, talking to the locals about the best things to do. I ended up with lots of great ideas. Another trick for getting orientated is to not be too quick to commit to a certain hotel or restaurant. Take a look around before you set in stone what you're going to do. In the past, when choosing a restaurant, we would stop in at a restaurant that looked good with mixed results. Now we do something called restaurant hopping. We choose a restaurant, order one or two hors d'oeuvres or a main course and a glass of wine, then move to the next restaurant. During the whole evening, you can visit two or three restaurants easily and really get orientated as to what the local food is all about. I learned this concept from my friends Cindy and Gordon when we were in Dubai. We went to four restaurants in one night. We had a ball tasting all the different foods. At each stop, we ordered a few small dishes to sample instead of a full meal. At one point, we even had a restaurant bringing food to us at another restaurant. We were laughing so hard and having such a great time. Everyone thought we were a little crazy, but we enjoyed how much fun we were having. We basically experienced four days of eating in one night. So we knew what was good when we went out to eat the next day. On Easter Island, my wife and I did the same thing. We ordered ceviche at multiple restaurants to find out who had the best food in town. Surprisingly, the restaurateurs loved the concept and supported it completely. We were very upfront and honest with them about what we were doing. It actually made them want to perform at a higher level because they knew we were comparing them to everyone else on the same night. Go for it. When we returned from Easter Island to Santiago, our plane was once again a beautiful 787 Dreamliner. I was the last one to get on the plane, and as I passed by the cockpit, I asked if I could go into the front office, that's called the cockpit, and take a look. Before long, the pilots waved me forward, and I was shooting a video and taking pictures in the front of a 787 Dreamliner. I repeated the same experience when I was on the Emirates flight Airbus 380 en route from New York to Dubai. People always shake their heads at me and say, Paul, how do you do that? How do you have these amazing experiences? It's simple. If you're willing to do these five things... Continuously improve, be intensely curious, experiment without fear, ask if something is possible, and do not be afraid to look a little foolish. When it is your turn to travel, don't stress if you do not have all your arrangements made weeks in advance. Relax and think about how you can incorporate these five strategies into your preparation. There are always deals out there, so you don't really need to worry about booking everything way in advance anymore. In addition, you often get a much better price at the last minute than if you book something two or three months in advance. The tools are there for you to rent a car, reserve a flight, choose a hotel, and find the best restaurants or anything else you want to do in just a few minutes' time. Take advantage of them. Remember, Travel is a process that can be enhanced and improved like anything else. I'm constantly tweaking and perfecting the travel process to make my travel more effective and enjoyable. I do it in a very deliberate fashion. If you can learn to be fully aware of the process and identify the waste of clunky mechanics of every travel process, you will end up improving your life experience exponentially. And who doesn't want that? Now, I'm going to go off script here just before I read the one thing. As I read this chapter, I'm getting ready to go on an epic journey around the world with Bob Taylor. 
But believe it or not, as soon as I get back from that four-week trip around the world, I'll only be back for a few days, and I'll leave again on another around-the-world trip, this time going the opposite direction around the globe. And this trip, I'll be flying to Japan, Kazakhstan, Germany, and then back to Bellingham, Washington. So I had to begin to pack my bag so when I came home, I wasn't all stressed out, and I could just walk in and grab my next bag for Japan. And even today, I'm improving again the process of travel. Let me tell you the improvement that I've recently made to the way I pack, and it really enhances everything greatly. I have a small carry-on suitcase. I've now learned to put all my clothes that are from the waist up in one side and the waist down in the other side. So it's very easy for me to look in my suitcase and not have to dig through shirts and pants that are sometimes packed together. That never happens anymore. All my shirts are always on the left side. All my pants, underwear, and socks are always on the right side. This simple improvement enhanced the way I travel immensely. I open my suitcase, I go to the left for shirts, I go to the right for pants. It's very simple. If it's a bathing suit, it's going to be on the right. If it's a shirt, it's going to be on the left. If it's a pair of shorts, it's going to be on the right. The simple system, the simple improvement to the process of the way I pack is frankly delightful. It makes me happy because I struggle that much less when I travel. And that's really what lean travel is all about. The one thing, just-in-time travel is king, and flexibility is queen. So locking things down way in advance is not necessarily to your advantage. And one more thing. As I was recording the book, Greg, the engineer, looked at me and said, well, what do you do with all those coupon cards and all the registration cards at all the hotels and flight attendants and flight airlines and everybody wants you to have? The answer is, that's a bunch of crap. I don't mess with any of that stuff. You can get a way better deal online just in time than the small discounts that these airlines or hotels want to give you. That's all just a bunch of nonsense. I rarely ever put my points in. I never use points. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. That's clutter, overproduction, overprocessing, excess inventory, and all the rest of the waste all rolled into one. Chapter six, always. This is a fun chapter for me because it talks about principles that will constantly remove the struggle of travel and make it more predictable and enjoyable. Number one, always turn around and look back as you walk away from where you've been sitting. I can't tell you the number of times I've left something sitting on a seat or on the floor behind me. This is one of the most important processes you will consistently perform regardless of where you are and what you're doing. Always turn around and glance at the place you just walked away from to make sure you didn't leave your wallet on the counter, your water bottle in the chair, or your Bose earbuds didn't fall on the floor. This is my top lean travel principle. Number two, always carry things in the same place. Remember the phrase, a place for everything and everything in its place? Make sure you always put your headsets, your glasses, your electronics, your passport, or anything else you're using in the same assigned pocket. This will eliminate enormous amounts of wasted time searching for your stuff, and you will lose fewer things because you know to always scan their specific places to make sure you have them. It will take you less time to unpack in the hotel room and less time to repack when you leave. Three, always give your smile first. If you were born with a smile on your face, you will love giving that smile to people as you travel around the world. Greet everybody you encounter with it. When you travel, you encounter many people who are out there serving you and helping you. You should be grateful in your heart that they are willing to do this, and you should start off the relationship by treating them with a huge smile. I'm going to go off script here for one minute. I just posted a video not that long ago called Paul's First Job. You know, when I was 13 years old, the first job I ever did was selling flowers on the corner on 24th Street in National City. And the interesting thing about that is I was making upwards of $70 a night. And this was like more than 40 years ago. And I was 13 years old. How did I do that? 
It was so simple, it was unbelievable. Every time a car pulled up to that corner and the customer rolled down their window, I looked at him and I smiled and I said, sir, would you like to buy some flowers? That simple smile did everything. And I outperformed every other kid on every other corner by three and four times because I smiled and they did not. It is such a simple principle. Give your smile. It is so powerful. Four, always hand your passport to the customs official right side up with your ticket inside. Everything is a process, including boarding the plane and going through security. Make the process work more smoothly for you. Don't make people struggle to clear you through the gate or security or customs. When you properly orientate your paperwork, people will appreciate your extra effort. Five, always be the last one on the plane. Well, almost always. You heard me talk about this principle a little bit in a chapter just preceding this one but I will also go into more depth on how it can be very beneficial in most cases, so stay tuned. Six, always sit or stand close to the door on a bus. Now, I'm going to go off script here for a minute. This is a very, very strategic principle. This is particularly important when you're on a rental car bus. So it is important to be positioned near the door so that you're the first one off when it opens. The line for picking up rental cars can be a nightmare. There are great rental car agencies out there like Enterprise, but there are times when you have to use other companies who are less efficient. Be the first person off the bus and you will save yourself a lot of waiting in line. The same thing goes when you're getting off the plane or boarding a bus to take you to the terminal. There are times when you get off a plane, you go down the steps and you wait below for your luggage that might have been put in the back of a small plane. Well, I see time and time again, people rush to get off the plane and then everybody stand there in cold, wet, rain while they're waiting to get the bags off the plane. And I'm going, what are you people thinking? I casually just sit on the plane, let everybody file past me. I'm the only one sitting on the plane. I'm warm, I'm comfortable, I'm reading, I'm answering my email, and everybody's out there shivering in the cold while they unload this plane. It is the craziest thing. You have to think about the position where you are. Don't necessarily become a part of the herd mentality and just do what everybody else is doing. Oftentimes, think outside the box. You'll be shocked at how beneficial this will become. One more example is a lot of times you have to get off a plane and then get onto a bus, which then takes you to the terminal. And again, I see the same thing. Everybody rushing to get on this bus. And what happens? They get packed right in the center. Not me. I always wait to the very last minute. And you know what? Who's the last one to get on the bus? Paul, who's the first one to get off the bus? Paul, who's the first one to get through security? Paul, who's the first one to get the rental car? Paul. So you can see being a little thoughtful about the processes of getting on and off the bus can be very beneficial. Seven, always put your overhead luggage above you or in front of you. As you are going down the aisle to get on the plane, you should look at an overhead compartment and consider putting your bags in a position in front of where you're sitting. Why? If you get to your seat and you have to put your bags behind you because the overhead storage is full, when it comes time to deplane, you will need to wait for everyone else to get off before you can go back to retrieve your bag. I have put my bag in the overhead compartment in first class when I can see that the rest of the plane storage is looking full. Now, you may say to me, Paul, you just told me in the last one, it wasn't important to get off the plane first. Well, if you check your bags, that's the case. It doesn't matter. But if you keep your bags with you and you're deplaning into a terminal, that means the sooner you get off the plane, the sooner you can get to the rental car and so forth and so on. So sometimes it's very important to be the first one off the plane or as soon as possible, Other times, it doesn't matter, and it will be very strategic for you to get off at the appropriate time. The most important thing is be thoughtful about every process. Eight, always look to help others with their overhead bags. If everyone would just help the people around them get their bags down from the overhead storage, particularly people who are smaller and don't have the strength to easily lift them up and down, the time it would take to deplane the aircraft would be cut in half. If you ever want to observe waste, the waste of waiting, just watch how inefficiently people deplane an aircraft. 
I'm going to go off script here. This is like my biggest pet peeve in the whole world. From a lean thinker standpoint, to watch people get off a plane and get their luggage down is the most clumsy thing you've ever seen in your life. If I was running the airlines, I would solve the whole problem in short order. I would create a funny little video showing how if people just helped each other around them, that they could deplane in half the time and the cost of the airline tickets would actually go down because the expensive planes would not be sitting on the tarmacs empty so long. You could create this video, play it just before everyone landed, and everyone would be educated on helping one another and being friendly to one another so you could get off that dumb plane a little faster instead of waiting for 10 minutes sometimes, 15 minutes, to get your turn to get off that plane. Nine, always tell the flight attendant what great service they have provided. How would you like to be stuck in an aluminum tube for 30% of your life? These people work hard to make your flight enjoyable, and you should go out of your way to always have an attitude of gratitude, particularly when you're exiting the plane. I'm going to go off script. That's when I do it. I get to the very end of the aisle. The flight attendants are there, generally smiling and saying, thank you very much, and I say to them, Great service. I really appreciate it. And nine times out of 10, they look at me with almost shock. They go, wow, thank you so much. 10, always tell the pilot what a great landing they made. I'm a pilot. And as a pilot, I can't tell you one of the greatest feelings in the world is when your passengers tell you, wow, that was a nice landing. In the aviation world, they say, any landing you walk away from is a good landing. So technically, if you're alive and well, regardless of how rough the landing seems, the pilot did a great job. Let them know. I'm going to go off script again here. Specifically, this is what I do. I get to the end. I thank the flight attendant. Thanks for the great service. I literally crane my head around into the cockpit and I say, great landing. And they generally turn around just a little bit with a little bit of a smile. And they go, wow, I don't ever hear that. That is so cool. Well, I'm a pilot and I know what that feels like. That is just spectacular for someone to say that. So take a little extra effort. Make someone's day a little better. You'd be surprised how much better a person it will make you. 11. Always take out your earphones as the flight attendant approaches. I have a friend, Barb, who is a flight attendant on Alaskan Airlines, and she gave me a lot of great advice about how to be a good traveler. Of course, I asked her the question. I'm going off script right now. I said, Barb, you know, what makes a really good passenger? I was asking her one day, and this is what she told me. One of her pet peeves is people who leave their earphones in their ears when she is asking them what they want to drink. Often she has to repeat herself several times which hampers her ability to serve all passengers efficiently. All we need to do is be a little mindful as the flight attendants approach and pull out her earphones, anticipating a question so they don't have to repeat themselves 10 times in the course of three or four rows. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. 12. Always leave the bathroom on the plane cleaner than you found it. I don't know anybody who likes to walk into a dirty public restroom. Leave the bathroom a little bit better than you found it. Pick up the paper off the floor and drain and wash the sink out. If everyone in the world just thought this way, can you imagine how much more pleasant our lives would be? I'm going to go off script here. One of the hallmarks of FastCap, my company, is our bathrooms. They are sparkling clean with bidet toilet seats. It's a manufacturing facility and our bathrooms look better than the Ritz-Carlton, and I am not exaggerating. The way we've done that is we've trained our people to treat other people with respect. And when you leave a bathroom and you leave it in perfect condition, you're basically saying, I respect the next person that comes there. And when you approach life this way, when you have this attitude that other people are important, it projects through every facet of your life. So if we can get people to do something as mundane as maintain a sparkling bathroom at our company, that mentality translates to the workbench, the work area, to their home, to their car, and everywhere else. So I say, if you really want to see what lean is all about, I challenge you to walk into any public bathroom 
and leave it a little bit better than you found it. Again, if everyone did that, could you imagine what the world would be like? 13. Always check in early and carry the confirmation number with you on your phone. It's not always possible, but make it your routine to copy and paste your confirmation number into your calendar and into the online check-in system. This way, you avoid mistakes and the inconvenience of going through hundreds of emails to find your confirmation number. Back to the eight ways, I'm going off script here. Going through all those emails, that's the waste of over-processing. You see, waste is everywhere, but if you have a great process where you can easily retrieve in a predictable way every time the confirmation number, you're not going to waste your time, your energy, looking for things that you don't need to look for because you were thoughtful about the process. If you're running late, go straight to security. I create a screenshot of my boarding pass on my iPhone by holding down the home button and the on off button at the same time. The screenshot gets stored with my photos. I show the screenshot when I'm checking in and it works perfectly. I don't even need the electronic boarding pass to get on the plane. So I'm going to go off script here. I hope you understood what I just said. I never use the electronic boarding pass. Why? Because when I have to retrieve it, I have to open up my emails, click on it, click back and forth and do all this nonsense. But if I do a screenshot of the electronic boarding pass, it's always in my photos. It's basically one, two clicks and it's there absolutely for sure. That process has enhanced my travel dramatically, and it's a cool little trick. The second thing I've done, and I don't talk about this in a later chapter, so I really want to go into it now, is the way I manage my travel documents in my calendar. So as soon as I make an airline reservation, I immediately do a screenshot of the confirmation on my phone or on my computer. That's in my photos. Then I copy and paste that information into the calendar event. I actually color code all my calendar events according to the item. So for instance, if I'm doing public speaking, that is green. If it's a flight, it's blue. That represents the sky. If it's orange, it means it's a health endeavor, like going to run a marathon or doing a triathlon. So every part of my calendar is color-coded. But the important thing is the moment, or just in time, the moment I make that reservation, I take all those details and through a very careful and thoughtful process, I apply them to my calendar along with the confirmation number so I never, ever, ever search for that thing. It is a waste of time going through hundreds of emails trying to find the confirmation number so you can check in early or you can confirm something over the phone or whatever it is. So make your process or routine very clear and you will save yourself so many headaches and life and travel will be blissful. So as most of you know, I love this off script stuff. Forget about reading the book. And as I (laughs) told you about that last experience, how important it is to do a screenshot, Greg, our sound engineer who's recording this said, Greg, what did you say? (laughs) Well, yeah, I was coming back from Hawaii, racing through security, had my phone logged into the airline account with my ticket right there on it. And then my account timed out just as I'm handing it to the security guy. I tried to pull it back up. It wanted me to log back in. Just a huge mess. And then he says, "Uh, we don't have time for this. Go get a paper ticket. Had to go back to the counter, get a paper ticket, come back, wait in line again. I could have saved all that time by just doing the screenshot, like you said, which of course, on my next trip, I did that. I know. You know, the funny thing about all this lean thinking, sure, it's going to save you the time. And the time is very valuable to you Mm -hmm. and me. There's no question about that. But what lean thinking really does for me, Greg, is it makes my life more enjoyable. I don't struggle. And because I don't struggle, I'm emotionally more fit to do a better job in my life, if you will. Yep. But when you're struggling and everything's just a little bit of a hassle, you get an attitude. And I'm not into <laughs> having an attitude. I like to be happy, man. And good processes make me happy. Absolutely. And make sure your battery on your phone 
is juiced up enough that you can show them a photo when you get to the line. Exactly. I think we're on number 14. 14. Always bring your own thermos. I always travel with my stainless steel Starbucks coffee mug. It's super convenient. My drinks stay hot, and I've always got water, coffee, or tea to keep hydrated. An added bonus, I can't tell you the number of times people have complimented me on how beautiful my thermos is. I didn't just buy a thermos. I bought a beautiful thermos that not only makes me feel good when I look at it, but it makes me want to drink more because it's stunning in the way it was crafted. I sometimes laugh at all the environmentalists that are out there concerned about all the plastic and waste that is generated from water bottles and paper cups. The whole problem could be solved with a simple campaign to get personal and reuse your own drink container. If everyone did this one simple thing, all the packaging waste eliminated would be staggering. So go buy the highest quality, sexiest drink container you can find. Hydrate your body and save the earth. 15. Always keep your passport and wallet in the same pocket. Throughout this book, I have used the word routine in place of discipline. This is deliberate. I learned this concept from What Makes Olga Run, a book about Olga Kotelko, a 90-year-old Canadian woman who is in excellent condition and still participates in track and field at a very high level. Kotelko's routines, not her discipline, have kept her in such great shape. As the author Bruce Garrison so keenly observed, Routines remove the vagary of discipline. Don't say to yourself, you need to remember to put your passport and wallet in the same pocket all the time. Rather, make it your routine. That way you are never saddled with the inconvenience of misplacing or losing those important items. And you can always retrieve them fast and easy. Never rely on discipline to maintain exceptional habits. It is better to develop strong routines. 16. Always carry a pen with you for filling out the customs forms. I spent a good part of my life stressing out when the custom forms were handed out because I didn't have something to write with. Now I always keep a cheap, lightweight pen in my backpack for filling them out. I can't believe how much this simple thing has streamlined the travel process for me. In addition, I memorized my passport number, 46, oh, four, no, I'm not going to tell you. No, I won't say it online here. I memorized my passport number, which makes filling out those forms that much easier. Another trick with customs forms is to know the name of the hotel where you're staying. Information that is often requested on the forms. If you don't remember, don't stress out. Customs officials rarely care what the name of the hotel is. I usually just call it something like where the area is that I'm staying. For example, if I'm going to Baja, I write down the Baja Hotel. If I'm in Astana, Kazakhstan, I write down the Hilton in Astana. Customs officials have not questioned me about this even once. Don't let me get started about the waste that these documents have created in the world. I'm sure somewhere there must be a room filled with billions of these little white forms from countries all over the world. You would think at some point they would have digitized them. We are living in the 21st century, aren't we? 17. Always fill out the customs forms as soon as you get it on the plane. Remember, one of the main tenets of lean is to not create batch work, piles, or to-do lists. Great lean processes allow you to do everything just in time as the demand is received. Don't wait on anything. Take care of it right away at that moment. If you fill out the customs forms right away, you can peacefully rest for the duration of the flight. Procrastination is the friend of failure and chaos and a whole host of other things that will reduce the quality of your life. Avoid it at all costs. 18. Always get your visa in advance. 
The truth is, you can travel almost anywhere in the world and get off the plane and get an emergency visa at the airport. However, acquiring a visa after you land when you are tired, hungry, and ready to do something besides wait in line can be a real drag. For me, it's worth paying a little extra money to get pre-approved and secure the visa ahead of time. It's one less thing I have to contend with when I'm traveling in a foreign country. 19. Always take an apple and nuts as a snack. It would be nearly impossible for you to walk up to me and not find an apple or nuts in my backpack. I love life, so I take my health seriously and refuse to eat junk food because I wasn't prepared enough to bring a healthy snack. I only fuel this Ferrari, my body, with the best quality food. I'm going to go off script here. My wife and I recently just flew back from New Zealand and Australia, and we flew business class. It was wonderful. It was a very long flight, and I appreciated all the extra niceties that went along with that. But you would think flying business class, I would say, oh, well, the food's going to be fantastic. And indeed, generally speaking, the food is very good in business class, but it's not always healthy. I got on that plane with four apples, a couple bananas, and an orange. And I got off that plane with a couple apples and an orange. I didn't rely on business class feeding me healthy food. I relied on Paul feeding me healthy food. I'm serious about my health. It's why I look the way I look. And I'm very thoughtful about every process, including the way I eat. That's all documented in my book, Lean Health. I document my entire transformation, how I basically went from 217 pounds to 170 pounds. I'm a triathlete, and I could run circles around most 18-year-olds, and I'm 56 years old. 20. Always carry your luggage onto the plane. There are two concepts here that are important to note. First, if you need to check your bag, you are bringing too much stuff. And second, maintaining control of your luggage is a surefire way to maintain control of your travel. There's nothing worse than losing a bag. Once when my wife and I were traveling to Aspen, I had all my ski gear packed in my bag. I wasn't planning to check it, but the overhead compartments were full, so I had no choice but to check it in at the gate. When we got off the plane, somebody grabbed my bag that was sitting on the jetway, and I grabbed theirs. At the hotel, I opened up my suitcase and realized that none of the things inside were mine. We had very similar cases, so the mistake was easily understandable. But that didn't solve the problem. As a result, we had to purchase thousands of dollars worth of ski clothes at a very expensive store in Aspen. I since added some kind of mark on the outside of my luggage, an orange ribbon, a sticker, my business card, whatever it is, that allows me to quickly identify my luggage from everyone else's. Now it would be nearly impossible to grab the wrong bag, especially since I rarely check it. 21. Always arrive one hour before your flight. I once had a young girl ask me what the key to life was, and I told her it was to understand the power of margin. Having a little margin, or in this case, a little extra time or resources at your disposal, will come in very handy. This particularly applies to the aviation industry. You never know what the check-in lines are going to look like or how slow security will be. Believe me, they can both really surprise you. Someone once told me that the real adventure starts when everything goes wrong, but I don't ascribe to that at all. The real adventure starts when things go as planned and you have the freedom and flexibility to do whatever you want to do. Arriving early at the airport helps you ensure that happens. 22. Always go to your gate and confirm it is the correct one before you go shopping or to the lounge. In the past, if I had an hour before I needed to get to the gate, I would go get a cup of coffee or head to the airport lounge. Never again. I've had gates change on me and had to rush to an entirely different terminal to get to the new gate in time for my flight. Large airports like Dallas-Fort Worth or Chicago O'Hare can really throw some curveballs at you. So go to the gate, make sure you understand exactly where your plane departs from, then go get the coffee. 
I'm going to go off script here because I had one of the most amazing things happen to me. I have been invited to do some awesome things. And last summer, I was invited to go to San Tropez on vacation for a few days with Aiden, the president of the BI group in Kazakhstan. Aiden did something so special for me. He arranged for a private helicopter to pick me up in Nice, France, and fly me to San Tropez and land me in his backyard on his villa overlooking the water. It was a spectacular experience. But there was one problem. The plane was delayed leaving Vancouver and arriving in Frankfurt. The result was there was a strong chance I would miss my connection flight. And I was landing in Frankfurt. And if any of you have ever been to Frankfurt, it's a massive complex. The plane that I was taking to Nice, France was an entirely different terminal. I asked the flight attendant, did she think I would make it? She said, impossible. It was a minimum of a 45-minute walk to get from one terminal to the other, and there was no way to get there faster. I said, you know what? I've been training for an Ironman, and I'm pretty fit. I'm going to go for it. I don't care. I got off that plane with my suitcase in my backpack. I clipped my backpack in, pulled that strap tight, and began to run full speed. And I'm going to tell you, I was suffering because it was not easy. I was hot. I was sweaty. That suitcase was heavy. But I said, I will not give up. I traversed that airport in 20 minutes and arrived at that gate as the door was swinging shut, drenched in sweat. And all I can say is, thank God I was in great health because sometimes these airports can throw the biggest curve at you and a little extra time is nice. Unless, of course, you're training for an Ironman. Plus, there was no way in the world I was going to miss that private helicopter flight. 23. Always ask for the emergency exit row aisle seat. If you like being a sardine, don't ask. But any flight attendant or traveler in the country will tell you the normal seats on a plane are uncomfortable and that you are much better off if you get the emergency exit row. I'm shocked at the number of people that file onto a plane and sit in their assigned seat without trying to get a better one first. 24. Always ask local residents for their insight. Get really good at asking questions. You can get so much information if you learn to ask even simple questions. In Patagonia, our guide told us the very best time to come back and hike was December and January. I asked her, if she was coming back, when would she go? She said between Christmas and New Year's. The weather is great. There aren't many people. It was great advice. If you don't dig and ask a lot of questions, you're going to miss out on some prime nuggets. On our trip to Chile, Argentina, we asked our guys what restaurants they would eat at. I never asked them where a good restaurant is. I wanted to know the ones the guides go to. They live there so they know all the local favorites. They know where the best value and the best quality converge. Some of the best restaurants I've ever eaten at in my life have been on the advice of Santi, our guide in the region. One was a steakhouse in Bariloche, Argentina. The other one was in Puerto Varas, Chile, which had the best king crab I've ever eaten in my life. Ask, ask, ask. Dig, 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 and discover gold. 25. Always double check. On a recent trip, we had to turn around no less than five times for people who forgot stuff. Chip and Kathy forgot their coat. Morgan forgot his laptop at one stop and his wallet at another stop. We had to take a ferry back to an island to retrieve it. Lisa forgot her phone at the breakfast table. All this happened in the course of one week. So much time was wasted going back to retrieve these things. Lisa had to do without her iPhone to take pictures in Patagonia for seven days before the phone could finally be transferred to a city and meet up with us. This backtracking could have been avoided with a quick double check each time. Remember the principle earlier on. Number one, always look back as you walk away. 26. Always say thank you. Whatever you do, 
Don't wait until the end of a trip to say thank you. Say it throughout the entire experience. It will change everything. A thank you is the extension of your gratefulness, and a grateful heart will make everything infinitely better. 27. Always pack two days before your trip. There are two advantages to doing this. First, it removes all the stress and anxiety of having to pack at the last minute. If you prepare yourself in advance, you can sit back and enjoy the experience. Second, you give yourself time to mull over the details of the trip and come up with anything you might have not packed. This makes it less likely you're going to forget something, making the trip that much more successful. 28. Always check the five-day weather forecast before you leave. I use an app called MegaWeather, which gives me a 10-day forecast and a nice overview of what I can expect the weather to be like at my destination. By knowing the weather you are going to encounter on your trip, you can avoid the need to buy clothes you could have brought with you from home. 29. Always take a look at Google Maps to orientate yourself before you arrive. This helps you create a map in your mind of your destination. You learn where the airport is, where the hotel is, and where the place is you're traveling to. It will save you a lot of time because you will be able to understand travel distances, times, and directions better. You'll enjoy your destination so much more if you don't get lost. Orientate yourself. 30. Always check the local tipping customs in every country you will be visiting. In many countries, tipping is not necessary. In other countries, the tip is automatically added in to everything you buy. If you do a Google search to learn the norms, you can save yourself a lot of money and angst. 31. Always check to see if the U.S. dollars are widely accepted in a country. More and more, I find that businesses around the world will accept U.S. dollars, which means you do not have to pay in local currency. When you exchange money, you lose a lot of value through poor exchange rates and high fees. So it is to your advantage to avoid it. Again, it helps to do a quick Google search to find out before you go. For example, if you search, does Thailand accept U.S. dollars? You will learn that it generally does not. However, if you are in Chile, the last place you would expect them to accept the greenbacks, many times they do. 32. Always confirm the price and details of any transaction before you commit to it. When someone quotes you a price, repeat it back to the person and confirm the details. I cannot tell you the number of times I've said yes to something and then I get halfway into the deal and find out it's costing me much more than I anticipated. Trust me, you can afford taking five seconds to nail down the details. 33. Always confirm and repeat all all directions before you leave the person helping you. Repeating the directions is so important. By doing so, you make sure you didn't misunderstand them and you cement them in your mind. 34. Always take notes immediately on the details. If someone tells you something, don't tell yourself you will remember to write it down at a later time. Record everything now, just in time, using one-piece flow and shunning batch work. For example, if someone says, let's meet at 8 o'clock, immediately set an alarm on your phone for 7.45. It's as simple as saying, hey Siri, set an alarm for 7.45. In the time it takes to say those words, your life will become much less complicated and you will eliminate the ups and downs and unevenness that so many people experience in life. In addition, by writing things down, you force yourself to double-check the details of what the person is telling you, confirming there are no defects, no mistakes, and no waste. This saves a lot of grief later. Remember, lean is all about creating processes that eliminate defects, mistakes, and wasted time, and rework. All these tips are clear processes that do exactly that. As I'm recording this, Greg's hearing me say this, and he says, you know, another improvement would be just to record them giving you directions. And I thought, that's exactly what Lean's all about, continuous improvement. Greg's idea is even better than mine. You record it. There's no way you can make a mistake. You can play it back over and over again. What a brilliant idea. Great job, Greg. 
Okay, 35. Always compare at least three restaurants before deciding where to eat. When looking for a restaurant to eat at, I used to always go into the first one that looked good. After dinner, I would continue my stroll down the street only to find there was a much better restaurant just steps away. Now I make it my practice to review at least three or four restaurants before I decide where to eat. 36. Always put your razor in a case. To save weight and space in my suitcase, I switch from an electric razor to a disposable razor. When I packed it up for the trip, I would toss it into my shaving kit without putting it into a case first. Then one time I reached in and pulled out the razor and those super sharp four blades slipped my finger open like a stuck pig. I spent the next week nursing that very painful cut. 37. Always leave a tip for the maid. We rarely see them and they work so hard. I always marvel at how clean my room is and how perfectly the bed is made, even when I leave it in such a mess. I love to think about the people we really never see and do something to show them my gratitude. 38. Always build extra margin into everything you do. If the meeting time is 8.30, don't plan on arriving at 8.30. Plan on arriving at least 10 minutes early. That way, if something comes up, you will still be early enough to alleviate the stress associated with rushing to get there on time. Being punctual also makes sure you won't be branded inconsiderate by the group you are meeting. 39. Always remember, slow is fast. One time I was rushing to get on my seat on the bus when I moved too quickly up the aisle and caught my coat pocket on one of the seatbelt mechanisms, ripping my down coat wide open. Did rushing save me any time? No. It cost me extra time. Worse, I had to find a replacement for my $300 Patagonia coat because I was in a very cold climate in Patagonia, actually, and couldn't afford to go without one. When you start to rush, beware. Slow down. You could save yourself from a costly mistake. 40. Always keep your roll-on suitcase in the center of the check-in counter and out of sight of the person checking you in. If you get to a check-in agent who is overzealous about the weight limitation, he will make you weigh the suitcase and then make you check it if it's only a half a pound over the limit. It makes no difference whether or not it will fit in the overhead. If the agent can't see the suitcase, they won't question it. Just be prepared when they ask you if you have anything to check in, say, nope, just carry on. 41. Always make a great first impression. Once, when I was on a tour, the tour leader introduced herself, but I was a little distracted and didn't give her the attention I should have. She sized me up immediately as a problem child, and everything went downhill from there. Be extra alert when you first meet people, especially leaders, and listen carefully to their instructions and directions. Put your cell phone away and don't answer emails or text messages during the critical first 10 minute introduction. The rest of your trip will go much better. I guarantee it. 42. Always pull, not push your bag down the aisle in an airplane. There is a powerful concept in the lean world called pull and push. You want everyone to pull from you based on their true demand. If you push something on someone, there will always be waste. Think of all the wasted food the airlines pass out that is not eaten. I shouldn't say pass out. It's actually pushed out. An example of the airlines ignoring the lack of demand or pull for the actual food. They're just pushing it on you whether you want it or not. The same goes for how you move down the aisle of an airplane. In this case, remember your lean principles and pull your suitcase down the aisle. If you want everyone in the aircraft to think you have a low IQ, push your suitcase down the aisle instead of pulling it. You will soon steer it into the side of the chair and hold up everyone else on the aircraft. Pulling works much better in manufacturing and in travel. 44. Always make travel a top priority in your life. 
Travel will fill your mind with understanding and your heart with friendships that will transform your life. The one thing, a small, consistent routine is a thousand times the power of a Herculean discipline. Chapter 7, The Experienced Traveler. It's 5 a.m. I'm about ready to board a 30-minute commuter flight from Bellingham to Seattle. I'm sitting close to the gate answering emails as a line of people crowd together to get on the plane. Instead of joining them, I sit there and remain productive. When the gate agent announces the final boarding, I calmly get up, walk to the counter, having not wasted the 10 minutes that everybody else did standing in line. She scans my phone for my boarding pass, no paper, no fumbling to find my ticket, and I head for the plane, where the other passengers are already sitting down. As I enter the plane, the flight attendant greets me warmly, and I return the greeting with a smile. My assigned seat is 2B, a bulkhead seat with better leg room than most of the other seats on the plane. Still, I'm not satisfied. A man is sitting in the seat next to mine, so I quickly scan to see if there is a better one available. To my delight, 1A, an aisle seat at the front of the plane with almost six feet of leg room is open. Without missing a beat, I put my small backpack in the overhead compartment, sit down in the best seat on the plane. The flight attendant briefly explains the emergency exit seat guidelines to me, closes the doors, and the engines start. Being an experienced traveler got me 10 precious extra minutes of work, a more comfortable seat in the boarding area, the best seat on the airplane, and it got me onto the plane without having to fight the crowds of people boarding at the same time. Not a bad way to start the day, but it gets better. We landed in Seattle and everybody rushes to grab their bags from the overhead compartment. Again, I do the opposite of the crowd. I sit calmly in my seat and let everyone else exit the plane first. When the plane is completely empty, I look outside and see the others waiting in the cold wind and rain for the bags to be unloaded plane side. They wait for about five minutes until the cart finally rolls up and everybody squeezes in to grab their bag. The whole time, I remain on the plane answering emails and being productive. When all the bags except mine are gone, it is time to get off the plane. As I stand up to leave, the flight attendant looks at me and says, you could always tell the experienced travelers. I smile warmly at her and thank her for the great service and friendly attitude. On my way out the door, I compliment the pilots on their great landing and walk down the steps, grab my bag, and head for the terminal. Once again, thanks to my experience as a traveler, I gained 10 more minutes of productivity and only had to face about 30 seconds of exposure to the wind and rain. My lean travel principles are really paying off. I hate waste and I can see it everywhere. I love efficiency and productivity. I love the fact that the vast majority of my life goes smoothly. Every year I receive thousands of emails from people all over the world saying how much their life has been transformed as a result of reading my books. They tell me stories of how their work is so much more enjoyable and how their home lives benefit from lean thinking and continuous improvement. I never tire of hearing these encouraging words, how people improve their lives without any outside help just because they learn to see waste and see things differently. A good friend of mine, Lauren Jones, says, once you see waste, you can't unsee it. As soon as you see all the waste that is robbing you of life's joy, you will be compelled to solve your problems and continuously improve everything. Yes, you can transform your life by simply fixing what bothers you. Someone else sent me an email that illustrates a point with even more clarity. Lean takes the stupid out of life. Think about it. Every day, each of us perform all kinds of processes that have a lot of stupid stuff and struggle in them. 
lean travel takes the stupid out of travel and replaces it with pure joy and satisfaction. The satisfaction from today's trip began ahead of schedule. 24 hours before the flight took off, I got a notice from Emirates Airlines on my phone that I could check in. I immediately, of course, just in time, no batch work, no delay, I immediately went online and began the check-in process. As I went through the check-in, Emirates asked if I'd like to upgrade to business class for $1,000. Hell yes, I would! The flight was 14 and a half hours long, and a regular business class ticket cost more than $5,000. Fortunately, I knew from experience and careful observation that the airlines discount these business class seats right before the flight. I also knew that it was important to check in precisely 24 hours before the flight to get the best chance of purchasing one of these discounted seats. $1,000 was a small price to pay for such a big improvement. Being in business class allowed me to continually work the entire flight, which is invaluable to me because my time is so valuable. My time is valuable because I'm very productive, which makes people willing to pay me more than most people could ever dream of. Thus, my lean thinking not only makes me more productive, it makes me more valuable and allows me to experience some of the finer things in life. You can see why I say, I don't like lean. I love lean. When I got off the commuter flight, I had not yet received a boarding pass for my next flight. So I went to the Emirates airline gate where the plane would be leaving in approximately two hours. There's no one there except one gate agent. I picked up my boarding pass, avoiding going outside the security to the normal check-in area, and asked the agent what time I should go back to the gate. He tells me the plane will be boarding at 8, and we will be in the air at 9, with the doors closing at 8.40. I double-checked to make sure if I arrived at 8.30, I would be sufficiently on time. He said, absolutely. So I pulled out my iPhone and tell Siri to set an alarm for 8.15. Siri replies that my alarm is set. With extra time now on my hands, I walk to the Alaska Airlines boardroom, or the Alaska Lounge, to work quietly and eat breakfast. At the front desk, I hand the receptionist my lounge club card, tell her I do not need a receipt, which would only be adding waste to the process, and I head inside. For breakfast, I would like a latte, an apple, and two hard-boiled eggs. If it were my first visit to the boardroom, you might struggle to find these items because the automatic espresso and latte machine is downstairs and the apples and hard-boiled eggs are upstairs. This is where your lean travel skills will help you out. As I mentioned in Chapter 5, when you go somewhere new, it's best to get the lay of the land before you commit to a restaurant. This is true wherever you are, including airport lounges. So when you visit a lounge for the first time, walk through the entire place to understand what is available. If there is more than one level, explore them all. If you don't, you might miss out on some important things. I can't tell you the number of times in the boardroom that people have asked me where I got the apple. And when I told them upstairs, they said they didn't even know there was an upstairs. I grab my free latte and walk towards the elevator. But the line is very long. Waiting is waste, and I will have no part of it. So I swing my backpack onto my back, pack up my suitcase, and walk up the stairs. The beauty of this is I'm getting more exercise and not sitting there unproductively waiting for the elevator to haul my fat, sloppy body to the second floor. I have turned the management of my health into a process. I am always looking for every opportunity to exercise and eat correctly, even opportunities as small as a one-flight walk up the stairs. Every second is precious, and I try to always deliver value and improve the quality of my life. If you think I'm obsessive about improvement, consider this. Everywhere I go, people tell me they want my life. I tell them they can have it if they learn to see waste and think lean. 
When my friends ask me, Paul, how do you do it? The answer is really quite simple. I just learn from my experience. There's nothing magical about me or my knowledge. Once you figure out how to deliberately learn from your experiences, you no longer allow stupidity to become a common habit that hurts your success. In order to learn effectively, you have to understand a few tools, and the most important one of all is learning to see waste. This is the key to becoming a successful, experienced traveler. The one thing. Open your eyes. Waste is everywhere. Your wealth and the quality life you seek will be found by eliminating your waste. And for the record, I'm not talking about bio-waste, but it is as true in the bathroom as it is in life. Chapter 8. All we need is fat Navy SEALs. The goal of this book is to help people live better lives by traveling smarter and teach them to learn and improve by incorporating the best practices they observe in the different cultures they experience. It has always been my goal to be positive and not seek to point out the negative or be negative. That said, this chapter is a blunt call to action for my fellow Americans. It contains a harsh message. Because I love my people and I love my country so much, I am compelled to share it. If you're not an American, don't point fingers at us. We all have problems. Whenever I think about the Navy SEALs, the most elite troops in the entire U.S. military, I think of people who are the epitome of physical conditioning and mental toughness. I say this with firsthand knowledge because I have a few friends who are Navy SEALs. No matter where they are in the world, enemies of the United States tremble at the thought of being hunted down by one of these highly trained warriors. The SEALs are held to extremely demanding standards of physical fitness, which sets them far apart from the physical condition of most Americans. If the average American were set out to pursue our enemy, they would be laughed at and return without succeeding. Why? Because we are the fattest, sloppiest people on earth. I warned you this message was harsh. It doesn't matter where I go in the U.S., almost everyone seems to be obese. This is not the case in other countries. I've traveled to over 60 countries, and it's rare to find one where the majority of the population is fat and overweight. I just returned from a month in South America, where I marveled at how many people were reasonably sized. Coming back to the United States, I was hit upside the head by the disgusting and sloppy nature of most Americans. It seemed as though we've accepted that the official symbol of being an American is to be 50 to 80 pounds overweight. Not too long ago, I brought a delegation of high-level international business leaders to the U.S. on a tour of different companies. Near the end of the trip, one of the American managers we met graciously offered each of my guests a golf pullover from his company. It was a wonderful gesture, but there was one problem. They were too big. The average weight of the people from my delegation was 150 pounds, and the box of golf shirts was sized for people like the Americans around us, most weighing 280 to 350 pounds each. When our host opened the box to let them choose the size, right on the top were the 3XL size pullovers. When I saw that, I knew we were in trouble. We went through the whole box and found only three mediums. The rest were too large. Our host sheepishly apologized, commenting that the pullovers were sized for big Americans. I thought to myself, you mean fat Americans. Don't get me wrong. I love America and think it is the greatest country on earth. But I was very embarrassed. We should all be ashamed of our ridiculous gluttony. My international guests were thinking the same thing. You could see it in their eyes. Our weight problem is everywhere. As I went through security at the airport this morning, I thought to myself, it must be required to be obese in order to work for the TSA. As that thought passed through my mind, a policeman walked by me who looked like he was nine months pregnant. Does anyone in America respect their body, I thought? 
everyone is fat. And not just a little fat, we have conditioned ourselves to think this is normal, when in reality, it is disgusting. I know you think I'm exaggerating, but look around. I challenge you to find people who are trim and fit in America. They are few and far between. The average American looks like they're three to nine months pregnant, including men. Just now, as I was boarding the plane from Denver to Seattle, there was a guy so big that he was hanging six inches over both sides of the seat and into the aisle. I could not get my rolling suitcase by him. So he had to lean over and envelop the guy next to him just so I could get past. What causes this type of obesity? I'll bet anyone a thousand bucks that if you're fat and overweight, it's not because of your genes. It's more likely because you eat food. Look around at all the people who are overweight, then watch what they eat. Add it up. The math is simple. We need about 2,400 to 3,000 calories a day, not 5,000 to 7,000. If you're going to stop me and tell me about the corporate conspiracy to make us fat or that our schools are not educating our kids about the proper nutrition or that the government is disseminating misinformation, I don't want to hear any of it. This is simply about personal responsibility and people engaging their brains. Good information and bad information are everywhere. We need to use our brains to figure out which is which. Our brains are the most powerful asset and we have completely left them on the sideline when it comes to nutrition and food. Personal responsibility does wonders if each person had more of it. We could solve 99.9% .9 of all of our problems if we just exercise personal responsibility. We cannot go around blaming someone else for our problems. I speak from experience and I can very easily point the finger at myself. I spent most of the last 30 years of my adult life overweight and unhealthy. I didn't understand the amazing gift my body was and abused it regularly, consuming poor quality sugary foods and having a lackluster exercise routine was all it took to make me look like everyone else in America. Then I woke up from my stupor and recaptured the health I always dreamed about. My transformation was so compelling that I wrote a book about my journey called Lean Health. It was not a hard transformation. It was an intelligent transformation that didn't require mountains of willpower or discipline. It simply required the intelligence of a fifth grader and the honesty of a kindergartner. Today, I walk through airports and convenience stores all the time, and I'm never tempted to eat all the junk food that's available. The corporate marketing plans are still in place, trying to lure us to eat things that are deleterious towards our health, but they don't matter because I now understand. I changed my mind. I educated myself. I used the potential of my brain. I stopped making stupid excuses. I stopped being a dumbass. I stopped blaming other people. I took responsibility. I started documenting the facts. I started understanding the facts. I started running experiments. I started analyzing information. I started thinking critically. I took action. During my entire transformation, I never blamed anybody but myself. It was my stupidity that put my health in the compromising position it was and my intelligence and common sense that lifted me out of it. If I blame my problem on someone else, I wouldn't have done any of those things and I wouldn't have gained any of those tools or resources for personal development. Blaming poor health on anyone or anything else is a crock of We have a free will. There are no handcuffs on any of us. Hey, I'm going to go off script here. You know, my engineer said, are you fat shaming? Well, first of all, I don't even know what fat shaming is, but I'm not trying to fat shame. I'm trying to speak the truth. Now, I understand there might be a very tiny percentage of people out there that might have some medical condition that might cause this. But the bottom line is, hey, let's face reality. 
I travel all over the world, and there are very few cultures in the world that have the problem that the U.S. has. So it can't be some genetic problem when the rest of the world is not obese and fat like we are. Sure, there are countries that are more fat, but nobody even comes close to what the U.S. is facing. We have to wake up and smell the coffee. You want to talk about the expense of our medical bills and everything that's going on in our healthcare system? It can largely be eliminated if we just took personal responsibility. When I meet most people and I walk into their homes and I walk into their bathrooms, you know what I see? A whole lineup of prescription drugs on the counter. I can't even imagine what that would be like to take all that crap every day. I'm telling you, this is largely self-induced. And I am 99% sure that is the fact from a couple observations. Number one, my own life and what I did to myself. And a lot of my close friends have gone through the same thing. And I've seen the same thing repeated over and over again. We need to wake up. The one thing I really enjoy about travel, apart from dodging all the garbage in the airports and convenience stores, is the voluminous amounts of fresh fruits and vegetables I find all over the world. People in other countries are not exposed to the same amount of prepackaged crap we Americans eat. Food is for nourishment. It is not to mask pain or fill voids in our unbalanced psychologies. Here's my advice. Stop opening packages when you eat. Instead, Peel a banana, bite into an apple, taste and enjoy fruits and vegetables. You won't believe what you've been missing. Eat plants, not things made in plants. I'm not a vegetarian, but I have changed my diet to make sure 80% of it comes from fruits and vegetables. I get my protein from fish and chicken and nuts. Everything is so simple. Instead of lowering our standards for what it means to be healthy, we need to raise our standards. We would never dumb down the requirements for the elite Navy SEALs. Can you imagine? Hey, First Lieutenant Stevenson, your mission is to go out and capture and kill the bad guys in Afghanistan. And by the way, don't worry about your beer belly. I'm sure you won't have to chase them down. We shouldn't dumb them down for ourselves, our children, our law enforcement, business and political leaders, teachers, professors, bus drivers, health professionals, doctors, scientists, pilots, mothers, fathers. Everyone is fat and grossly overweight. For the love of God, America, wake up. Not even the Navy SEALs can protect you from this stupidity. The one thing, America, open your eyes. The world is shaking its head at you. Chapter 9, Horse's Ass or Diplomat. I am a triple A personality. I'm not passive. I'm very determined. And when I have a goal, I go after it. And I will not quit until I achieve it. In the past, I was perfectly capable of tearing someone a new one if they crossed me the wrong way. However, I've learned through the process of continuous improvement how to temper myself in the most trying situations. It is important that as humans, we are continually reflective. The Japanese word for this is hansei, which means to reflect on actions and improve them over and over again. With my strong leadership tendencies, it was important to embrace this philosophy, lest I become bound to always getting my way and hence never learn or improve. What follows is an epic story of self-control and continuous improvement. In it, I achieved an extremely favorable outcome in the most unfavorable circumstances, largely because of my determination to reinvent myself and not settle for business as usual. In the past, I typically didn't concern myself with other people's approval, but this time I could see clearly that if I ignored public opinion, it wouldn't matter how right I was, I would lose this epic battle. In my wildest imaginations, I could have never written a story with more twists and turns and drama. The plot unfolds around a month-long trip my wife Leanne and I took to Chile, Argentina, Easter Island, Brazil, and Patagonia. It was a trip we had been looking forward to for a long time. Both of us are very busy executives in our company, FastCap. She gets to work at 6 a.m. every day, and if she's lucky, she leaves by 7 p.m. For nine months of the year, I travel, speak, and consult all over the globe. So whenever we get time to be together, it is a special and important time. For this trip, Leanne did most of the planning. She organized the trip through a tour company called Overseas Adventure Travel, or OAT. 
It was our second major trip with OAT. In 2015, we took a fantastic one-month trip with OAT to Southeast Asia. We were so happy with our experience that we had already booked an additional one-month trip to Australia and New Zealand in 2017, and were in the planning stages of an additional trip to Antarctica during the same time period. We were still friends with the group leaders and new friends we had made on that trip. In Southeast Asia, I produced 13 videos documenting the trip, which had thousands of views and preserved many wonderful memories for our entire group. They also proved to be great marketing tools for OAT. After seeing them, our good friend Dana wanted to join us on the trip to South America, as did a new couple, Morgan and Lisa Lohman, who had never traveled outside the United States before. They saw the videos and wanted in on the adventure. Everyone was expecting to have a great trip. Prior to our departure, Leanne corresponded several times with our group leader, Graciela, to make sure we had everything we needed for the adventure. Their communication was cordial and non-eventful, but the calm was misleading. Yvonne Cunard, the founder of Patagonia, said that real adventure starts when everything goes wrong. Not only was everything about ready to go wrong, but the was going to hit the fan and I would be tested for intelligence and political sagacity. On the first leg of our trip, Leanne and I flew into Santiago, Chile, where we met up with the rest of our group. We really did not know what to expect, though we had traveled extensively throughout Mexico, Central America, Cuba, the Caribbean, and we loved the Spanish and Latin cultures. South America was a continent we definitely wanted to discover with its rich diversity of cultures and European influence. One thing for sure, our expectations were high and we were looking forward to seeing new places, especially the enchanting region of Patagonia. At the airport in Santiago, we met our local guide, Paul. Paul was warm, friendly, and outgoing. Everything we had come to experience with the other guides we had had in Southeast Asia. But we both thought it was odd that Graciela did not meet us herself. Normally, the primary trip leader would meet us at the airport because she would be in charge throughout the duration of the trip. It was not a big deal, but it was a little strange. When we first met Graciela at the hotel, she didn't seem as warm as we expected. She asked us how our flight was, and my wife exclaimed, It was awesome! Graciela looked at her with no expression and uttered, Oh, as if to say, Aren't you a strange bird? Who says awesome after spending 16 hours on a plane? My first thought was maybe she was not a happy person but I quickly put this aside and allowed her to continue her lackluster orientation. For whatever reason, Graciela just didn't seem excited about the huge adventure we were all about to embark on. Unfortunately, her attitude went downhill from there. We got our room keys and went upstairs. To our surprise, the room had three single beds in a very small and crowded space. Unhappy with the three-star accommodations, I picked up the phone and asked the desk manager if they had a room with one queen bed instead. He said no, and that this was all they could give us. Again, we were surprised at how the trip was starting. OAT is not a cheap outfit, and it usually provided us at least four-star accommodations, unless we were staying in some very remote location. Santiago, Chile is not remote at all. I knew Graciela was still down in the lobby, so I asked the desk manager if he would put her on the phone. I explained my concern to her, and she snapped at me and told me that having single beds was the standard. I was shocked. I was the customer, and she was telling me I was wrong and didn't want to help? I explained that we never had this kind of accommodations on our previous trip with OAT, and she again barked at me and said I was wrong. I told her I didn't think she was listening to me and that I hadn't come on a one-month-long vacation with my wife to sleep in a separate bed. She retorted that I wasn't listening to her. At that moment, I knew I was going to lose this battle and that I needed to back off and get away from a very tense situation. I pulled the phone away from my ear and lowered it very slowly to the cradle without saying a word. Graciela's hostility was palpable. 
and I felt I needed to back away or something bad was going to happen. A few minutes later, the phone rang, and she asked me to come down to have a meeting with her in 15 minutes. No problem, I told her. I would be on time. Before I made it downstairs, my wife went to the lobby. Graciela came up to her and told her she would not be disrespected. Leanne explained, we weren't disrespecting her. We simply requested a bed together. Graciela told her the queen and king beds were for the single customers and couples were only given a bed together if they requested it beforehand. Leanne replied that when we traveled with OAT before, we never had to do that. Graciela stuck to her guns and said that was how it worked. When I arrived soon thereafter, Graciela held out her hand and said, Hello, I'm Graciela. Let's start over. Her tone was gruff and authoritative. I held out my hand and shook hers and said, okay. She explained to me that if we were going to be together, I needed to give her respect. I said in a very quiet and respectful voice, respect is something that's earned. Apparently, that wasn't what Graciela wanted to hear. She began to insult me again and call me a machine in a very low, demeaning fashion. It was an odd comment, but I guess she said it because I was so measured and showed no emotion. I knew being emotional would do nothing but exacerbate the situation. Graciela was charged and looking for a fight, and I was running as fast as I could. Believe me, avoiding confrontation is not in my nature. My willingness to not fight with her came from continuous improvement I've implemented in order to make myself more agreeable in group settings. I am a strong leader, and I'm fully aware that sometimes you have to be willing to follow and not always lead. The conversation with Graciela was going to go nowhere, so I quietly walked away. We did not speak to each other for the rest of the day. The next morning, Graciela confronted me again at breakfast. I was minding my own business, eating and talking with my friends and my wife, when she cornered me, demanding my respect. Up to this point, I had attended every meeting, outing into the city, always been attentive, and never doing anything to distract from the group. I minded my own business and tried to steer clear of Graciela's hostile demeanor. Nonetheless, she was relentless, and I again walked away without saying a word. There was no way you could have a conversation with her. She was hostile from start to finish. Her agenda was clear. She wanted me to grovel and say I was wrong, when all I had done was ask for a queen bed. In my mind, this was a very minimal standard for a trip that cost thousands of dollars. The last thing that would be appropriate in this situation would be to apologize for expecting something so basic. The next day, she confronted me and demanded I leave the trip right before we were ready to go to Easter Island. I told her I was not prepared to do that. She got in my face, but I did not respond to her. I was not about to allow this woman to destroy a very special vacation that my wife and I had been looking forward to for over a year. We all boarded the bus and headed to the airport. When we arrived to check in, Graciela did not have a ticket for me. She had already canceled it, thinking I would back out. When she saw that I did not, she had to scramble to secure a ticket for me so I could get on the plane with the rest of the group. Despite her antics, I never said a word to her or showed any disapproval in any way at all. When we got to Easter Island, we had about three hours before our next scheduled event, so Morgan and I decided to rent a scooter and a four-wheeler to go exploring. When it was time for the bus to leave, we asked Graciela if we could follow the bus to our next outing, and she seemed to have no objection. When it was time to go, we pulled in behind the bus on our scooter and four-wheeler and prepared to follow it. To our astonishment, the bus pulled out and sped away from us at over 60 miles an hour on a dirt road. We took off in hot pursuit, like policemen on a high-speed chase. At first, we managed to keep up, although barely. I ride motorcycles at a very high level, and it was everything I could do to keep up with the bus which was going around corners at speeds that seemed totally unsafe. Eventually, though, we had to give up. Morgan fell behind first. His scooter was too slow. My quad was faster, but even when maxed out, it could not stay up with the bus, which was flying. 
we admitted defeat and slowed down. When we got to the town where we were scheduled to visit, Morgan and I crisscrossed up and down the road looking for the group, but to no avail. We never found it. Later on in the afternoon, we reconnected with everyone back at the hotel. I asked my wife what happened, and she said the group couldn't figure out what was going on. The bus was driving so fast that the women were squealing as it went around the corners. The only thing I could figure is that Graciela told the bus driver to lose us, so he drove at ridiculous speeds to do it. The irony of the story is that she had told us that we were visiting a quiet little island where everyone moved at a very slow speed and we needed to tone down all of our expectations because things happened very slowly. The trip only got stranger from there. The next thing you know, Graciela was barking at Leanne for being a few minutes late to the bus, along with two other people. Graciela waved her finger in my wife's face and said, if we were ever late again, she would leave without us. Leanne apologized over and over, but Graciela wouldn't stop. She continued to reprimand her in front of everyone until she started crying. Other passengers tried to console Leanne by saying they thought Graciela was out of line and they were sorry she was being so mean. It was clear that Graciela was taking out her disapproval of me on my wife. Other people were often late and were never scolded. In fact, Graciela herself was late and held the rest of the group up and no one paid any attention to it. That's just part of traveling with the group. My wife's tardiness was inconsequential compared to other people's, yet she received a scolding that was completely uncalled for. We were beginning to wonder whether this trip was a good idea or not. Surprisingly, the rest of the three days on Easter Island were relatively uneventful. I was able to steer clear of Graciela and not have any incidents. We had a fantastic time, but she was clearly not the friendly leader we had expected. She had very little energy and was not excited about anything unlike the rest of us. The experience that we had on Easter Island was epic, and I was having a great time documenting the entire trip. I was committed to having the trip of a lifetime, and that's exactly what I was doing with the exception of dealing with Graciela and her abrupt and unfriendly disposition. We flew back to Santiago to stay one night before we went to Buenos Aires to meet up with the rest of the main trip travelers. While we were away, OAT had evidently decided that the first hotel was substandard that we stayed at in Santiago, and it changed to a new one. It was just blocks from the previous hotel and much better. We all commented that if we had just stayed at this new hotel in the first place, there would not have been any problem at all. The next morning, our group flew to Buenos Aires for a few days before going on to our next location, the region of Patagonia. In Buenos Aires, we went to a tango bar and had a fantastic meal while enjoying a great dance show. During the entire time, Graciela stayed away from the group. My wife thought she saw Graciela in the very back of the room making phone calls during the show, but thought nothing of it. Afterwards, we all got back on the bus, and she asked us how we liked it. We all said it was wonderful. Then Graciela made a very odd comment. She said with great gusto, I am so happy. We thought it was strange because up to that moment, she was not happy about anything. We got back to the hotel room around midnight. Leanne went to check in for the flight the next morning to Bariloche. She became alarmed when she noticed the flight that was supposed to take us to Seattle three weeks later had been rescheduled and we were now booked to fly home to the United States the next morning. We couldn't believe it. Leanne spent the next four hours on the phone and working with the airlines to see what had transpired. I also sent emails to OAT in the United States saying we had a very serious problem and we needed their assistance. We received no response. When we called the airlines, they told us they changed our tickets because we had called and changed it. My wife informed them we did not call and change anything. This seems strange. We called OAT again and they replied that yes, they had spoken to Leanne earlier in the day and she had changed the ticket. My wife told the agent that she had never talked to OAT or the airline. At that point, the agent on the line began to put everything together and realized that Graciela had called and impersonated my wife using our passport numbers to change all the airline tickets. 
All of a sudden, the OAT agent on the phone was doing some serious backpedaling. She promised they would call us back, but never did. OAT wasn't taking responsibility for anything. The agent knew Graciela had committed fraud by impersonating my wife. The one upside was we now had some clue about what Graciela was up to. So the next morning, rather than being completely caught off guard, we were prepared for something crazy to happen. Needless to say, we only slept about an hour that night. By the time we sorted through everything that had transpired, it was about five in the morning and we had to wake up at six to leave. As we got ready to leave the hotel for the airport, Graciela walked up to me with a large envelope and said, Paul, you're no longer on the trip. You and your wife are going home. She handed me what appeared to be an airline ticket in a large white envelope. I quietly told her I was not going anywhere, that this was my vacation and I was staying on the trip. I refused the tickets and walked away. Graciela insisted and said we were no longer on the trip. I began to walk towards the bus as all the other people on the tour looked on in total shock. Two people from the OAT office in Buenos Aires were there to support Graciela and her devious plan. Now we knew why Graciela was so happy the night before. She had spent the evening lying, distorting, and conniving with the OAT management to throw us off the trip. I couldn't believe it. This all happened because we wanted a queen bed together. I went to the bus and tried to get on, but two or three men and a woman from the Argentina office blocked our path. I was quiet and did not push. I did nothing but stand there trying to get on the bus as they let everyone besides Leanne and me get on the bus. The whole situation was surreal. It was hard to believe what was happening. It was the craziest thing I've ever heard of. As the other passengers boarded the bus, they told the OAT managers they were making a huge mistake and they didn't have the facts and didn't know what had been going on. When the bus was loaded, the door shut, and my wife and I were left standing on the streets of Buenos Aires watching the bus drive away without us. Leanne was in tears. When I looked at her, I thought, oh my gosh, this cannot be happening. I cannot let this happen to her. About 60 seconds later, we came to our senses and quickly hailed a cab as we drove away. The OAT employees chased our cab and yelled, asking, where are you going? We told her, she kicked us off the trip. So what business of hers was it? We decided to at least go to the airport and try to get on the flight to Bariloche. We thought we could salvage the trip by renting a car in Patagonia. We knew the agenda so we could at least go and visit the same places, even if we were not with the group. Leanne had been able to get us checked in the night before on the flights from Buenos Aires to Bariloche. Ode had canceled our main flight home, but hadn't touched our in-country flight, so we thought we would be able to get on the plane. We got into the same line as our tour group, but when Graciela saw us, she went up to the counter and spoke to the agent. When we got up to the check-in desk with our bags, the agent said we had been removed from the flight and had no tickets for us. We both showed them our phones that had our check-in information and boarding passes, but they said we were not in the system. Somehow, Graciela was able to get our tickets canceled. How she had the power to get the airlines to do this was staggering. She spoke in Spanish, so we didn't know what she was saying. The whole group was watching all this take place and confused at how she could treat a customer this way. When we realized everyone was in cahoots with Graciela, we quickly grabbed our bags and went to another counter where Leanne was able to find someone to help her. At the next counter, the LAN airline agent was mystified at how we could have been removed from our flight. Thankfully, he was not a part of Graciela's maniacal scheme, so he simply reissued the ticket and put us back on the flight. While Leanne was working with the new ticket agent, I was on the phone with the OAT top agent, Elizabeth, pleading with her to help us. She would have none of it. She completely agreed with Graciela and was not interested in hearing my side of the story. She said the decision had been made and we were removed from the trip. 
I explained that they didn't even do their due diligence. They didn't ask anyone else on the trip, nor did they call the guides that we had worked with in Southeast Asia. I asked them to ask somebody for the facts, but she refused. I repeated over and over in a very calm tone that OAT was making a massive mistake, but she insisted we were off the trip. Regardless, we proceeded to the gate with our newly issued tickets and we took our place in line. Graciela saw us coming and went over to the gate agent, speaking in Spanish to them for a while. When the agent scanned our ticket, they pulled us aside and said there was a problem with them. We asked what was wrong, but they ignored us. We asked for a manager and they ignored us again. Soon, everyone had boarded and we were left standing there speechless. Three times right in front of us, Graciela was able to get LAN Airline to cancel tickets we had been issued. After the plane had been loaded for 10 minutes, the airline employees were trying to figure out what to do with the two of us. I had never seen anything like it. Finally, for reasons that are still unclear, the agent came to their senses and said the tickets were valid. They scanned us through and we walked onto the plane shocked and relieved at the same time. We could not believe the drama that had just unfolded over the last two hours. We were kicked off the trip, had to get a cab without speaking the language, figure out what airport to go to. Then we were kicked off our flight three times, but we were able to negotiate to get our tickets in a domestic airport that we had never been to before. Now we were back on track, walking up the aisle of the flight to Bariloche, Graciela had the most disgusted look on her face as we walked by, but we didn't acknowledge her. We minded our own business and sat down. When we landed in Bariloche, we went to get our checked bags. Graciela stood across the baggage carousel from us, fully engrossed in a telephone conversation with a very upset look on her face. We grabbed our bags and went to rent a car and find somewhere to stay. Our fellow travelers looked at us in dismay. One woman was crying and many of them said, good luck. We are so sad this is happening to you. Graciela had really put everyone in a difficult place. Our friends traveling with us were upset, but they were also worried she would retaliate against them and get them kicked off the trip. Our new friends were clearly not happy with what had transpired, but they were afraid to go against her as well. We ended up deciding to stay at a different hotel than the rest of the group, thinking it best not to rub it in that we made it to Bariloche despite Graciela's plan. We were trying to make the best of a bad situation, even though it was at great expense to us, over $800 for the hotel and car alone, not to mention the cost to come as we would travel onward. OAT had ended the conversation with me saying they were standing by their decision to cancel our flights and we were on our own to make our way through South America. When we scheduled the trip originally, we had told OAT we were planning to go to Iguazu Falls by ourselves after the official trip ended. We had already booked those flights and hotels on our own, so we planned to stay and meet back up with our friends when the tour was over in about three weeks. We spent the day making our way to our new hotel and getting situated. We let our friends know where we were staying and made the best we could of a very strange situation. Later when we were at dinner, I received a call from Elizabeth at OAT. She told us that they had replaced Graciela with a new trip leader and we were welcome to join up with the group in the morning. We said we would. We didn't ask how or why that decision was made. We took the high road and decided to just move on and join the group. When we met him, we were pleased. He didn't seem to harbor any preconceived ideas that we were the problem people. We made it a point not to talk about what had happened with everyone, but instead to forget about what had happened and move on. The rest of the trip was amazing. Santiago and the local guides at each place were so good. Other travelers thought it was a blessing in disguise that we had to experience what we did so the group could have a better trip leader. Santi was friendly, happy, and informative and fun. We ended up with a great outcome in spite of a bad attitude and continued efforts of Graciela to derail our trip. Thankfully, I had made improvements in the way I deal with difficult situations before we went on the trip. 
One thing is for sure, you should not expect all your travels to go perfectly. There will always be problems and ups and downs, but if you embrace lean thinking and continuous improvement in the way you pack, plan, and improve your disposition and attitude, your travels will generate fantastic stories that you will tell over a glass of wine for years to come. Speaking of stories, did I tell you the one about the binoculars in Africa? Keep reading. The one thing, stay calm and your travels will become stories to tell over a fine glass of wine. Chapter 10, know the facts and understand the details. Africa is a land that seems so far away for most of us. For a long time, I dreamed of going to Africa and going on safari, but it appeared out of reach. Could I afford to go there? Would I ever be able to make the time to go to a land so far away? With its multiple languages and cultures, how could I negotiate the unfamiliar environment successfully? I had lots of questions and certainly not all the answers, but I kept trying to find them. In the lean world, we emphasize the necessity to observe, ask questions, and fully understand the facts before we proceed to make changes or improvements. This deliberate approach makes problem solving more effective. When I teach lean, I sometimes give this example. If you're a marksman and you're into handling guns properly, you might have heard the saying, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. If you jerk the gun, if you try to pull it out too quickly, you're more than likely going to miss. But if you're smooth and slow, you're more than likely to hit the target every time and thus achieve your objective. The same goes for lean problem solving. Take the time to get the facts and know the facts so you will not have any unwanted surprises. When I was 52 years old, I finally had the opportunity to visit Africa, one of my major dreams in life. My wife and I were very thorough with the trip planning. We wanted to get things right. We spent much of a year trying to figure out who we would work with in order to explore the continent. We finally settled on and beyond a top tier African tour company based in South Africa. We took along our good friends, Cindy and Gordon, who were total hoots and fun to be with. Just like most of our trips, there would be a few twists and turns and Cindy and Gordon would be in on all of them with us. The four of us were ready to have a fantastic time. The trip would be full of firsts for me. My first time on an Airbus 380, an amazing double-decker airplane. My first time seeing lions in the wild. My first time walking with a cheetah in the bush. My first time seeing a leopard in a tree after it had made a kill. I could never put into words everything we saw, but I made a video for each day I was in Africa, so it is all documented. We met up with our friends at JFK Airport in New York, where we boarded the A380. Upon arriving in Johannesburg, South Africa, our guides picked us up at the airport and drove us two hours to our first camp, the Pinda Forest Lodge, where we would begin our safari. The whole idea of a safari is to take you into the middle of nowhere, but I guess I didn't realize just what that meant. I mean, we were in the middle of nowhere. As we approached the camp, we had to drive through a small African village where people were selling things on dirt streets. Everything seemed very primitive. I was very nervous that our lodging would be primitive too. We paid a lot of money to go on this trip and I was expecting some nice accommodations. We had worked very hard to do our research and we didn't want any surprises. As we approached the entrance to the camp, we only saw one small wooden bench sitting beside the road. The driver stopped got out and said, okay, you're home. I thought Cindy and Gordon were going to kill me because I had just made them spend $20,000 and it looked like we were about ready to get ripped off. My lips were trembling, but I got out of the car without protesting. Before long, a young man showed up with a wheelbarrow, loaded it with our luggage and began to roll up a narrow dirt trail and through the bushes. I followed along wondering what was going on. Were they going to walk us into the bush and mug us, take our money, our passports, and leave us to the wild animals? I had anticipated driving up to a grand entrance with a large port cachere where a bellman would greet us with a nice hot latte, not walking up a narrow dirt path through the bush. 
My fears were premature, though. After about five minutes, the path opened up into a beautiful clearing where there was a fantastic lodge overlooking the savannah with wild animals everywhere. The porter showed us to our room where we would stay. As we walked down the trail, a man carrying a spear went with us, just in case an unfriendly animal jumped out of the bushes. Our private tent was nothing short of five stars and stunningly beautiful. Best of all, it was in the middle of nowhere. You could not see anyone. As soon as the porter and guard left, all you could hear was the commotion of the wild animals around you. The porter cautioned that when we wanted to leave the cabin, we needed to call and have the guard come and escort us to the lodge. Walking around by yourself was not an option here. We were also warned never to leave the door open. In fact, once we opened the door for a bit too long, and I mean just a split second, a monkey ran in and stole an apple from our fruit basket. This is a little bit off script, but that monkey had our number. When we were walking up that path, he must have looked at us and said, lunch. We would not be disappointed at all by the ambient experience. It was nothing short of over the top. Later that afternoon, as we settled into our room, we went on our first game drive. We loaded into an open vehicle with James, our ranger. Everyone was so excited. We were on safari in Africa. For the next couple of hours, we drove around, frequently stopping for James to point out interesting animals, plants, and other unique features of the landscape. Many were right next to the land cruiser, but some were very small or way off in the distance, so James used a pair of binoculars to identify them. Neither Gordon, Cindy, Leanne, or I had thought to bring binoculars, and after an hour and a half of passing the binoculars around between us, we decided we needed to get some of our own. When we got back to camp, we went to this tiny gift store at the lodge, Inside the store, a small locked glass case containing two pairs of binoculars, exactly what we needed. I asked the sales assistant if we could try them out. She nodded. She opened the cabinet and handed me the binoculars. I took them outside to observe a bird that was about 20 feet away. Oh my gosh, I exclaimed. I have never looked through a pair of binoculars that clear and sharp before. The young woman did not speak much English, but I was able to inquire how much they were. Using a calculator, we figured they cost about $350 based on the current exchange rate. The price seemed a little bit expensive, but we were in the middle of nowhere, and they were excellent quality. I wasn't planning on coming back to Africa anytime soon, and I really wanted to be able to see everything without having to wait for others to finish using the binoculars. What the heck, I thought. It sounds like a reasonable proposition. I was about to buy them when the clerk told me something that was a little curious. She said, I could rent the binoculars if I wanted to. I calculated the cost of renting them versus buying them, and there really wasn't much difference, so I decided to buy them. Man, did I have the facts screwed up on this one. I was in a bit of a hurry because we were only about 10 minutes away from another game drive, and I wanted to secure the binoculars and get on the truck to start looking at all the cool things James had been pointing out. At this point, I should have reminded myself to slow down, get the facts, know the facts, understand the facts, and you won't have any unwanted surprises. There were so many warning signs, but I ignored them all. Now, after having traveled to 60 countries, I am keenly aware of those cues, and they will never go unnoticed. I travel with other people and I see them miss things all the time and they end up with all the unwanted surprises, the cab fare that cost three times more than they thought, the tour that didn't include five additional things, the dinner that was twice as expensive as they first thought, all because they ignored the facts and didn't take time to make sure there was clarity with the information that was being given them. A few minutes later, Cindy came by and I told her about the great binoculars I had just found and they were really not that expensive. She quickly ran into the gift store and asked to look at the other pair in the case. She tried them out and was amazed at how good they were. She was also happy because they were only $300, a little less than the ones we had bought, and she felt they were even a better deal. We both pulled out our credit cards and purchased the binoculars, along with a couple shirts and a hat that said Pinda Forest Lodge. The hat would be the subject of another unbelievable story that unfolds on our second trip to Africa. We signed the receipts without paying much attention and hustled outside for our next game drive. 
one thing I did notice was that in the course of 10 minutes, the shopkeeper's disposition became nothing short of giddy. I wondered what the big deal was. We had only spent about $750 plus a few more shekels on a hat and some shirts. I guess she was delighted that she made such a big sale so quickly. When we got into the range vehicle, James looked back at us and saw both of us with our new binoculars hanging around our neck. Wow, you got the good ones, he said. Can I look through them? Sure, I said, and passed them forward. James took his first gander through our new binoculars and told us how amazing they were. I thought James's binoculars were nice, but he said someday he wanted to have a pair like ours. In my mind, I was thinking that Cindy and Gordon and Leanne and I were kind of big tippers, so by the time we were done with our safari, we would probably tip him enough that he could buy his own. For those next two weeks, we enjoyed Africa much more because we never struggled to see anything. We could see every whisker on a lion's nose, every wrinkle on an elephant's hide, and every fly buzzing around the hyenas as they tore into their kills across the savanna. All of us wish we could have stayed in Africa longer, but after a few magical weeks, it was time to go home. We went to the airport in Cape Town to begin the long journey home. Before we left, we requested our refund for the VAT tax on all the purchases and gifts we had bought while we were in South Africa. Leanne went up to the counter with all of our receipts to process the paperwork, and the clerk gave her a receipt back with the amount that would be credited back to our credit card calculated in U.S. dollars. Leanne came over to me and told me we were getting back $500. It seemed a little high, but I didn't think much of it at the time. A week later, Leanne got a phone call from Cindy and asked if Leanne had seen her credit card bill for the binoculars yet. Leanne told her no, not yet. Cindy dropped the bombshell that the binoculars were not $300. They were $3,000. Leanne wanted to call the gift store in Africa to check the price, but Cindy told her she had already gone online and researched Sikorsky binoculars. She found them on Amazon for over $3,000. Leanne and I both stood there in shock when we did our own online search and saw the price. Now I knew why the woman in the shop was so giddy. She had just made the biggest sale of her life. She probably sold more that day than the store usually sold in a month or several. Cindy and Leanne laughed as they remembered how the lodge staff hugged us and said how they would miss all of us. We wondered what all the loving was all about, but chalked it up to a friendly staff. After everything settled in and we realized the magnitude of our mistake, Leanne and I both agreed that it was a painful mistake, but at least we could afford it. Besides, we wanted to only remember all the wonderful things about Africa. Without a doubt, our safari experience was greatly enhanced by having the exceptional binoculars. Instead of letting the mistake taint our experience, we turned it into a positive. We tell the story to all our friends and laugh about how we made such a big mistake. Another good thing about it is that I learned a very, very valuable lesson. When someone says they're going to do something for me, whether at home or traveling, I make sure I understand in detail exactly what the price is and what's included. The result is I don't have many unwanted surprises. Clarity is king when you travel, just like cash is king. Take an extra 15 to 30 seconds and ask a few more questions, no matter where you are. Make sure there is absolute clarity before you give the cab driver the directions to where you want to go. Confirm that he is willing to sit and wait so you will have a cab when you come back out. Get the driver's phone number. Program it into your phone. Call it right away to make sure it rings on his phone. When the hotel staff gives you a Wi-Fi password, write it down in front of them. Make sure it works so you're not running up and down the elevator trying to get the Wi-Fi working. If someone tells you a meeting time and location, double and triple check it so there is no ambiguity. The list goes on and on. So much of travel can be enhanced by simply taking a few seconds longer and making sure you have the facts and total clarity. Above all, make sure you know the real price when you're looking at Swarovski binoculars. The one thing, 100% clarity is golden and it will save you a lot of gold. Chapter 11, details. I'm gonna go off script immediately here. 
Many of you know that I'm very passionate about the Japanese culture, and I've spent a lot of time in Japan. I actually do a lot of teaching in Japan, bringing companies from around the world there to understand why the Japanese have been so successful. Well, I've really distilled it down to just one basic thing. The Japanese are very, very precise. Or another way of putting it is, they are not sloppy. They pay attention to the details. And their obsession with details allows them to produce very high quality products that the rest of the world wants. So as I observed this transcend through their entire culture, I began to realize really just how sloppy I was in my life. And as a result, I started spending a lot more time paying attention to details and being more precise about everything I do. As a result, I wrote this chapter, chapter 11, called Details, and really a lot of the thinking is the result of what I've learned from being in Japan. So with that as the backdrop, you'll hear my points here in this next chapter, Details. When I did the outline for this book, I came up with over 48 different chapters. There was no way that Paul Akers was going to write a book that long. I'm all about short and simple and cut to the chase and get to the point and get it over with. As I finished the last few chapters, I noticed there were still a few things that I really needed to discuss. So I decided to add a chapter that summarized some important points and call it Details. Everything you're about to read is the result of me observing processes and then asking myself the following two questions. Where is the waste and how can I improve this process? By continually answering these questions, my travel experience is enhanced and more enjoyable. If you develop these same habits and ask these same questions about everything you do, you will experience the benefits of lean thinking at the highest level. In this chapter, I'm simply going to create a heading for every subject and give you a paragraph or two about my thoughts. So let's get going. One, the perfect workout. When I travel, it's important that I maintain a routine that makes me feel healthy, vibrant, and alive. Most of us have gone on vacation and gained 5 or 10 pounds, then regretted our laziness and lack of discipline. There is absolutely no reason for that, and I've completely solved that problem by creating the perfect workout I can do anywhere in the world. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning is drop to my knees and do 100 push-ups and 200 sit-ups. That's basically it. This eight-minute daily routine I have never missed keeps me tuned up and ready to go. Other than that, I make it a point to move at least 10,000 steps per day. That's all I do to stay in top physical shape. Two, how to eat healthy. Eat plants, not food made in plants. It's really that simple. Don't open a package. Eat only fresh produce and fish, and you will thrive on vacation. Everywhere I go, I seek out beautiful vegetables and fruits that are readily available throughout the world. The key is you have to train your eyes to see these great healthy foods. Once you've done that, you'll find them with great ease. Just today, I checked into my hotel in Astana, Kazakhstan, and they gave me a beautiful fruit basket with 15 different pieces of fruit. Why was I so fortunate to have this? Because I made it very clear to everyone I know that this is what I eat, and I do not want sugary or packaged foods. You couldn't spend more than an hour with me before you discover the clarity I have regarding how I fuel my body. My friends and colleagues definitely know this. En route to Kazakhstan, I stopped in Frankfurt, Germany for a few hours. My good friend Michael Altoff and his girlfriend came to visit me at the airport. I was shocked when Michael handed me an ice-cold smoothie out of a cooler he brought with him. He knew my health was very important to me, and he made and carried three smoothies with him for more than an hour on a high-speed train just so I could eat healthy food when my feet touched the ground in Germany. 
On another recent trip to Easter Island, our bus stopped for a few minutes so we could grab some snacks at a little store on the side of the road. Not me. I looked for another option. I saw a lady selling fresh produce on the side of the road and went over and bought a bag of fresh tomatoes and some tangerines. Well, everyone else was fueling themselves with the packaged crap from the mainland. I was nourishing my body with beautiful fruits grown in the island's rich soil. Throughout this book, I have tried to explain my thought process and how lean thinking has influenced the way I travel. The top priority in the lean world is improving quality. We always ask, how can we deliver more value to the customer by improving quality and simultaneously driving down cost? Understanding the value of quality is what allows me to so easily make healthy decisions while others are so easily tempted by what is cheap and fast. Eating correctly is not an incidental activity or afterthought. It is my top priority. In this case, my customer is my body. And the only thing I will offer to my customer is the highest quality healthy food. Now, I'm going to go off script here for just a minute. You're listening to me, and some of you might be thinking, man, that guy is, like, pretty hardcore about things. Well, I had someone say something to me about two years ago that I've never forgot. You know how people say things to you, and it just makes a deep and lasting impression? Well, this happened to come from my cousin Pamela Pastore in New York. And she's very successful, her and her husband, they're stockbrokers and everything. And they had read my books and listened to my talks online and watched some of my videos. And she said something to me that really struck me. She said, you know what it is about you, Paul? And I said, no, Pamela, what is it? Everything for you is crystal clear. There is total clarity and what you're doing, and what you're trying to achieve. And I think it's that clarity that allows you to easily cut through all the BS and get to the heart of the issue. I paused and thought, man, Pamela, you know, that's exactly right. I deliberately seek for clarity because as a young man and a D&C student, not a really sharp academic, things were not very clear for me. And I had to work extra hard to make things clear so I could comprehend them and get my head around them so I could be successful. So I think because of that disposition, I seek total clarity. So when you read through my book, this book and other books, you might sense that that's really what's going on. And indeed, it's not happenstance. It's very deliberate. It's how I compensate. Back on track, back to the book. Number three. My health is everything. If you adopt this mindset, you will be shocked at how easy it is to take care of your health when you're traveling. If you don't have your health, travel can be difficult, and you surely would not enjoy it as much as you would if you were in great physical health. If you're a person who is full of excuses and you want to tell me how difficult it is, I guarantee it, it will be difficult. I never have a difficult time, no matter where I'm traveling. Maintaining perfect health is easy and an absolute pleasure. Simple routines like carrying several apples and some nuts in my backpack make sure I'm always prepared in the rare event I can't find something healthy. You've heard me talk about my love for Kazakhstan and how much I appreciate and love the culture and the amazing hospitality of this great country. When I was there on my birthday in May, they had a great dinner to celebrate Armand's and Mitan's and my birthday. I stood up to make a toast. I told them I felt like I had Kazakh blood, that I really felt a part of the Kazakh people, and it was like I was at home when I was with them. Aiden, the president of the BI group, stood up and said, I was not just Kazakh, but I was also Nyman. He said that the Nyman people are a tribe of people from Kazakhstan that live by the water and eat fish. So I am Nyman. I focus on my health and only put the best nutrients in it. If you think like a Nyman, your body will love you for it. Number four, 
How to Load a Bus, Train, Boat, or Plane. I wrote about this in Chapter 6, but I wanted to give you a little more detail here. It may seem like a strange subject, but believe me, there are some very important nuances to understanding when you're getting on these four different modes of transportation. For example, if you're loading the bus that takes you from the airport to the terminal, you want to be the last one on. Most people rush to get off the plane and onto the bus. Then they just sit there while everybody else is getting on. Slow down. The last people off the plane will be the last people to get on the bus, which puts them the closest to the door. They will be the first ones to get off and reach the passport clearance zone. Customs can take a long time, so it's best to be in the front of the line there. Waiting a little longer on the plane makes that happen more easily. The same thing applies to the rental car bus. If you ever want to waste 20 or 30 minutes, make sure you're the last one off the bus at the rental car office. Rental car lines are ridiculously long and they move really slow. Take a spot by the door of the bus so you can be the first one in line to get the keys and the first one to drive away. There are a few exceptions to this rule, however. When you're on a bus tour that is going to last more than an hour and a half, you want to get a great view. You should be the first one on the bus so you can sit at the front and have the best vantage point. You might need to show up 20 minutes before the bus leaves to get that seat. If you're planning to board a train in Japan, you want to sit as close to the train's luggage area as possible so that when it's time to get off, you can quickly grab your bags and get to the platform. Japanese trains operate with high precision and they wait for no one. If you're a busy executive and you know you need to do a lot of phone calls during a long bus ride, it might be best to sit in the very back where you won't be disturbing everyone with your phone calls and communications. You can choose which side of the bus or plane to sit on based on where the best views are going to be. When we flew from Santiago, Chile down to Patagonia, I made sure I sat on the left side of the plane so I could view the mountains more clearly. When we were traveling to see the glaciers in Patagonia, I sat on the left side of the bus because I knew the glaciers would be on the left side of the road we were taking. It only takes a few clicks in Google Maps to find this out. People on the right side of the bus were struggling to take pictures, but not me. The important thing is to think about everything. Remember, details. If you are in a particular hot or cold climate and the sun is going to be shining on one side or the other, consider that too. Air conditioners on buses don't always work well, nor do the heaters. Pick the correct side so you don't bake or freeze. I'm also very careful to observe patterns of people getting on and off the buses. I even ask tour guides and drivers where to sit because that first-hand knowledge can be invaluable. Little details like these can make all the difference in the world. On a boat, the best place to be is in the center because there's less motion. You should also consider how cold it's going to be. Tourists tend to rush to the open area on the top of the boat so they have a better view. But it is often very cold on the water. When they get cold, they go downstairs to look for a seat and all of them are taken. With nowhere to sit, they have to go freeze their butts off on the deck for the hour they're on the boat. You already know my thoughts about loading a plane. Always be the last one on so you have the best opportunity to get the best seat. Don't rush to get on. You don't want to sit on those tiny little seats for any longer than you have to. The waiting area is much more comfortable than the plane. I'm going to go off script here. There is one exception to that plane loading last. Whenever I take a sightseeing tour, I actually always make sure I'm the first one on the plane because those planes are very small and there are generally a couple seats that are strategic and much better. Namely, I'm a pilot, so I always ask if I can sit next to the pilot and generally I always get that position, which gives me a great vantage point going forward. If you ever want to get a good example of that, watch my latest video that I did in New Zealand. It is fantastic where we're flying through the Swiss Alps of New Zealand and I have a wonderful vantage point in a small little eight-seater plane. 
So in the smaller planes, I like to get on first. I like to ask for the co-pilot seat. And then I pay very close attention to where the wing is. If it's a high wing plane, I want to make sure I sit behind the wheels if the wheels don't retract. Otherwise, the wheels are in the middle of every picture I take. So in that case, I want to sit in the back of the plane not in the front of the plane. So you got to consider all those things. Again, this is about paying attention to the details, being mindful, being thoughtful, so your travel experience is incredible. And it applies to almost everything. The same thing applies when getting on a helicopter. I always say, can I sit next to the pilot? In general, they always give me that position because I'm the first one to ask. Thinking about these details can really make a difference. You can be lackadaisical about all of the details. Perhaps it's not a big deal to you, but they have made my travel so much more enjoyable because all the little things add up to make big improvements. Five, how to book a flight. There are two good ways to book a flight. One is to use a website like Expedia that stores all your information, credit card, passport numbers, etc and only takes a few seconds to book a flight anywhere in the world. The site is easy to navigate, prices are generally reasonable, and it retains records and receipts of upcoming and past trips. The only disadvantage is that when you go to upgrade on the day of the flight, the airlines will not always allow you to do this because the flight was booked through a third party. That brings us to the second way to book a flight, to book them directly with the airlines themselves. If you book directly, you have more flexibility in terms of last-minute upgrades. This can be very important, but if the website of the carrier that you're working with is not easy to navigate or cumbersome, you could easily spend 20 to 30 minutes booking a flight that you could book on Expedia in 15 seconds. For long international flights especially, you have to weigh your options and determine the value of your time and the length of the flight and the options that you think you might need. I have a few airlines that I book directly with even though their websites suck because they will not allow me to upgrade to business class if I book somewhere else. This happens the most with long international flights. At the end of the day, though, Expedia is my go-to site because it is fast, easy, economical, has all my information, and is more effective than any travel agent I've ever used in the past or will ever use in the future. It is stellar in all regards. I'm going to go off script here. There are two other apps that are really good for booking airline flights. Skyscanner is fantastic, and the other one is Trip, which is great for traveling anywhere in Asia. Six, how to book a hotel. I talked about this in chapter five. The last minute is when the best deals are almost always available, period, end of subject. Seven, the travel map. I'm gonna go off script here. My travel map is spectacular. It is absolutely unbelievable. I love it. It's in my workout room in my home and every day I walk in and I go, wow, Paul, you have really traveled all over the world. It is so cool to look at and it's so well done and it's extremely visual. So here we go. I really recommend having a map that allows you to see where you've been and where you'd like to go. About five years ago, I ordered a large world map about three foot by four foot online and mounted it on one inch thick foam board I bought at Lowe's. The insulation foam board is sold in four by eight sheets, so I cut it down with a standard utility knife and used fast cap speed tape, peel and stick two sided tape, to stick the map to the foam board. I built a custom vertical grain frame for it and hung it up. Then I started putting push pins for all the countries I've been to around the world. The standard red and green and yellow push pins that you buy in the office supply store were a little small, so I took a red three quarter inch round fast cap, also from my company, and put them on top of the push pins. These are the push pins that have a little flat top, which highlighted and accented the map points and the countries. Eight, all of the scams. As far as I'm concerned, the mileage program for most airlines are a total scam and a waste of time. While I still put my mileage number in when I book flights, I can't remember the last time I was really able to use my miles. There always seems to be some exception or the airline wants to send you on some crazy route like routing you through Phoenix on the way to Alaska and you're departing from Bellingham. The next biggest scam is when you go to a car rental company and they want you to buy extra insurance or prepay for fuel. You've got to be kidding me. First of all, your insurance policy for your normal car generally has some kind of rental car coverage, and the credit card you use to rent the car often does too. 
Prepaying for fuel is a bad idea because the companies charge you extra high prices if you return the car without a full tank. The only way it possibly makes sense is if you return the car without a drop of fuel left in the tank. And nobody does that. The rental car companies know this and they make huge amounts of money off of people's ignorance. Nine, the perfect room checkout, never lose a thing. I can't tell you the number of times I used to check out of one hotel and into a different one only to realize I left my charger, my toothbrush, my razor behind. Now this rarely happens if it ever happens to me. I don't forget anything because I have a simple process that almost 100% guarantees I never leave anything in the room. First, I pack up my bag and my backpack roll them out to the door, and use them to hold the door open. Then with both my hands free, I walk through the entire room and my bathroom one more time, looking under the bed, carefully checking to see if I left anything plugged in or in the closet, safe, or desk. I'm not holding my suitcase, my coat, or anything else, which allows me to focus on seeing things I possibly could have left behind. I start in one corner of the room and systematically work my way out to the door. This has been invaluable for me. 10. How to check into the room. Hotels are notoriously slow for checking you in, and why it takes them 5 to 10 minutes to give you your room key is a mystery to me. I can check in for my flight in about 30 seconds on an electronic kiosk, but hotels go through this laborious long process to get you the keys and get you checked in. One technique I've used to speed up the process is to walk up to the counter with my credit card and license in hand and tell the clerk, I'm in a little bit of a hurry. Can we get this done really quickly? This puts a little pressure on them so they don't dilly-dally like they normally do. Next, when I get into my room, I'm very thoughtful about the way I unpack. I don't scatter my stuff all over the room. The more you scatter, the longer it takes to get packed up. So be thoughtful and careful about unpacking. Doing this will save you so much time and hassle. 11. Your phone and the rental car. Driving an unfamiliar car in an unfamiliar city can be sheer chaos if you don't prepare. I have learned it pays to slow down, get the stuff worked out, and then I can drive confidently to my next location. Long before I get to the rental car, while the plane is taxiing up to the terminal, in fact, I program where I'm going into my phone. I never drive out of the rental car lot until my phone has determined my location and knows exactly where to guide me. Set up correctly before you leave so you can enjoy your drive. When I get into the car, I put my seatbelt on, review the controls on the dash and steering wheel, and check the map on my phone to get a basic layout of the surroundings. Then I can enjoy the drive and not worry about finding the cruise control or the air conditioner. Make sure the phone has a good place to rest on the dashboard or console and plug it into your phone charger so its battery doesn't drain down as you drive. I always make sure my backpack is in the passenger seat so if I need to get anything out of it, it is within easy reach. Also, pay very close attention to where the gas stations are when you depart the airport because you will need to fill the car up when you return. You don't want to get ripped off by the rental car companies. I always rent the smallest, cheapest car possible. Small cars are much easier to park and easier to get around in, plus they use less fuel. When you do refuel, pay attention to the gas gauge. It has a small arrow to indicate what side the fuel tank is on. This will save you a little bit of hassle when refueling. If there isn't someone in the lot when you return your car, take a picture of the mileage with your phone so when you walk up to the counter inside the airport, you have the information easily accessible. The same process applies to dropping off a car as for checking out of a hotel room. Get all your stuff out of the car, and when your hands are free, go back through the entire car, checking carefully between and underneath the seats. The key is to have your hands free so you can concentrate and focus. I'm going to go off script here. One of the biggest improvements I've made to my travel is this. I bought a phone case for my iPhone on Amazon that is for running. And this phone case has hook and loop on the back side of it. It's basically the soft side of the hook and loop. Then 
it has an armband you put on your arm and that armband allows you to stick the phone to it. So it's not inside a plastic sheath. So it's really very convenient when I'm running. But the reason I'm telling this story is because I actually travel with peel and stick Velcro strips that are about two inches long. And that would be the hook side. When I get into a rental car, I take off a piece of that, stick it on the dashboard and my phone sticks to it. It is incredible because my phone is never shifting anywhere. I can orientate my phone in landscape or portrait mode, whatever works best for me. I can answer phone calls. It just works incredible. And that phone's not shifting all over the bloody car. It is really one of the best improvements I've ever made. And then at the end of the trip, I simply peel off that hook piece. It doesn't leave any residue. Put it back on the clear cellophane that it comes on. Put it back in my backpack in a strategic location where I always find it. And I'm always able to get my cell phone to stick wherever it needs to stick. For example, just the other day, I had to do a Skype call with someone and I wanted my phone to be hung at a certain position on the side of a wall. (laughs) Believe it or not, I just opened up my backpack, took out a piece of that hook, stuck it on the wall, put my phone on it and stood there and did a Skype call without fumbling for my phone. It was incredible. This hook and loop system on your phone is literally one of the best improvements I've ever made to my travel and just my general life. If you ever hang around with me, you'll see that I have hook and loop places everywhere, in my home office, in my office at FastCap, in my cars, and it takes a split second. I just hit my phone on it, boom, it sticks, and it's done. No opening up a clamp or some kind of a mount that holds your phone in there that's awkward and it takes two hands. It's just push the phone on the dashboard and it's done. It's so cool. I've got lots of videos of me doing that. So watch some of my videos on travel and you'll see all my cool tips and techniques. The best thing to do though is really subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, Paul Akers, and you'll see me post video after video of lean improvements at home, work, travel, and everywhere. And you'll be up to speed very quickly on the way I think about everything. So Greg, our engineer, asked me, well, what do I do about foreign travel with my phone, SIM cards, and everything? Well, in the past, I've had a couple different methodologies. Some countries, I'll actually buy a little Wi-Fi router that I can travel with me that is proprietary to their particular country, and then I'm always on Wi-Fi, and that works really well. The other thing I do is I have AT&T service, and to be honest with you, AT&T has been excellent all over the world. I've really had great phone coverage in the middle of the savannah in Africa or in Denmark. It doesn't matter where I am. And nowadays, AT&T has a service that for about 10 bucks a day, you can have pretty much unlimited calling and unlimited data anywhere in the world. And so my time, again, is so valuable. I told the story already. It's so valuable because I value my time and people are willing to pay me a lot more than most people get paid because I'm very astute at the way I manage my time. So for me, being able to be fluid in answering emails, taking phone calls, and communication on any trip is highly important. So spending $10 a day on a phone plan when I'm traveling is nothing in the scheme of things for the productivity it adds to my routine. 12. Music in the bathroom. I have to thank my good friend Michael Altoff from Germany for this one. When I stay at his home, he often lets me stay in his master bedroom. In the morning, I would wake up, turn on the bathroom light, and beautiful music would come out of the stereo system he had built into his bathroom. The second the bathroom light switched on, rock and roll would fill the room, energizing me as I showered and shaved. I thought this was so cool because you didn't even have to think about anything. It was all automatic. The music set the tone for the entire morning. As a result of Michael's example, I always travel with a Bose SoundLink Mini speaker system, which I play when I'm in the bathroom in the morning. It's a little heavy and bulky to carry with me around the world, but it's worth it. I love having high quality music when I'm traveling. It makes me feel like I'm at home. 13. How to be an educated traveler. This subject is not just about being an educated traveler. It is about being educated, period. The key to understanding the feel of a place you're visiting is to go to YouTube and watch five or six videos about it. I do this all the time and it helps me grasp the culture, the people, and what is important to see in a matter of minutes. My main example comes from when I visited Easter Island. 
I wanted to understand what the island was all about. I could have easily read about it, but I watched a documentary, and it gave me such an insight into what I was going to see and experience, because I knew what to expect and look for. The whole trip was that much richer. YouTube is great when it comes to educating yourself on just about every subject you could imagine. If you want to know how to run correctly, swim correctly, learn a new computer process, or find out about an exotic place, I go to YouTube. 14. The Knowledgeable Taxi Cab Driver There is no one who knows more about a city than a taxi cab driver. When you get in a cab, don't just sit there like a bump on a log. Ask the cab driver where the best place to go is, where the best restaurants are, where the cool spots that you can't miss are. Even more importantly, you should ask the driver where they're from. This usually turns into an interesting cultural exchange as they tell you about their life in Nigeria, India, Afghanistan, or all the other interesting places people come from to find a better life. I learned this concept from the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. The most important thing you'll ever do for any human being is to let them tell you about themselves and learn their names. It's not about you. It's about them. So I'm going to go off script here. You know, taxi cabs are great and taxi cab drivers are very knowledgeable. I have to be honest with you, though, I almost exclusively use Uber now. Uber is an amazing service. I love the fact I never have to get out my credit card, never have to pay anybody. I just book it and in three or four minutes, they're there to pick me up. I've never had a single problem with it. There's all these horror stories out there. I think it's all nonsense. It doesn't matter whether I'm in Krakow, Poland or Kazakhstan or in Thailand. I'm always using Uber and it works fantastic. It's a great service and I cannot say enough good things about it. And again, the same thing applies there. These people are locals. They know the area. They know the culture. They know the hot spots. Query them and you'll have some very interesting conversations and maybe make some new friends. 15, one, two, three. This is not a rehearsal. I live my life by a few powerful concepts. One of them is life is not a rehearsal. So many people think that they'll do something tomorrow, next week, or in a couple weeks. The time is now. Every second is precious. Make the most of every second in your life and stop making excuses on why you can't do things. Start saying yes. Your life will be remarkable. When I meet people and they invite me to come to their country and visit them, I don't think to myself, well, maybe I'll take action. Action, I look at my calendar and say, I'll be there in the next three weeks. The next thing you know, I'm in Portugal and a cell is showing me around all the beautiful sites in Lisbon and all the wonderful castles in Sintra. This has happened to me over and over again in my life and that's why I have friends all over the world. I'm always figuring out how to say yes. Life is very short. The sooner you figure this out, the better off you'll be. This is not a rehearsal. Okay, I'm going to go off script here. So just so you know, a cell is not really a cell. I had to rename her because the actual person who it is is a very famous person who I met in a hotel in New York. And she invited me to come to Portugal. And when I told her I was going to put her in the book, she said, no, Paul, I don't want the notoriety and the publicity. I'm just too well known and and all these other things. So her husband is a diplomat in a very well-known country and all kinds of other things. So at the end of the day, you just have to know there's somebody else behind this character called Acel, and she has an amazing life, and she's treated me to some of the most incredible times I could ever imagine in Portugal. Okay, 16, embrace the world. When I first went to Japan, I remember Brad telling me, don't be judgmental. Don't go into these factories and find all the problems. Be open, learn, and experience all you can. Because if you go in there with a critical attitude, you'll miss the best stuff. If you're always looking to pick things apart and find the problems, you're going to miss the beauty that the world has to offer. Always look for the positive. People comment to me over and over again, Paul, you're so positive. You're so nice to everyone. You go out of your way to learn people's names and recognize the waiters, the busboys, the bellmen, and the people who seemingly would be insignificant. That is correct. No one is insignificant. I love people. I love to acknowledge them, and I love to encourage them. 
This is the way I approach everything in life, especially when I'm in someone else's country. My favorite thing to do when I'm in Kazakhstan is to visit the canteens where all the workers eat. The women who prepare the food there are so hardworking and so diligent. They do a great job. I always go back in the kitchen and thank them for the wonderful food and get some really cool pictures with all of them. They are always a little shocked that there's an American celebrity in their country who is taking the time to acknowledge the workers in the kitchen. 17. Patience and the Leopard Everyone knows the old saying that patience is a virtue. It may be true, but I guarantee you patience is not in my DNA, nor am I particularly proficient at it. I have, however, learned to improve in this area, and I try to do the opposite of what most people do in exercise patience. Being patient has produced some of the most fabulous memories. My favorite examples of this all occurred in Africa when we were on safari. For each of them, our time spent waiting for something dramatic to happen paid off. Each time while we sat in our range vehicle with no other action occurring, Three or four other range vehicles drove away impatient and frustrated, but I insisted we wait. As a result, we saw several spectacular sightings occur right in front of us. The first one was a leopard that had made a kill and carried it up a tree for safekeeping. As we watched, the leopard climbed back up the tree and dragged the carcass down on the ground right in front of our range vehicle so close I could have reached out and touched the leopard. Yes, it's all on video. The second one was watching a cheetah that had also just made a kill. After about an hour had gone by, a pack of hyenas ran towards it, and the cheetah ran off and left the kill. We got to see the hyenas tear into it right in front of us. Simultaneously, we saw vultures jockeying intensely to get the meat while the hyenas chased them away over and over again. It was unbelievable. We were the only ones to see it. The third one was a female lion that had lost her cubs after she had made a kill. She was yelling loudly, hoping they would hear her and return to her. Unfortunately, she had left them several miles away up on a little knoll and they could not hear her. After an hour of her yelping, she left the kill and searched for her cubs. We followed her along the road for half an hour and we saw them reunite. It was amazing. The lioness then led them back to the kill with the rest of the pride, and they ate for another hour. Once again, everyone else missed the drama. The greatest one of all happened when we were in the Masamara National Reserve to see the wildebeest and the zebra migration. Thousands of the animals crossed the Mara River at one time, all while trying to avoid the crocodiles waiting intently for them. You never know for sure when the crossing is going to happen, but our ranger had a sense that it would be that day. So we parked on the riverbank and waited and waited and waited. Other range vehicles came and went, but none stayed with us. After about two hours, the crossing began right in front of us and we had a front row seat. It was a world-class sighting. All of these events are recorded in my Africa videos, and they are sheer drama. I was able to capture these memories because I did the opposite of what other people do, and I exercise extreme patience. Now I have memories that will last me a lifetime. 18. Time Zone Magic This is such a small thing, but it makes such a big difference. The second you get on a plane when you're going to a new time zone, immediately change the time on your phone and on your watch. The sooner you start thinking about the new time zone you'll be living in, the sooner your brain will adjust, making jet lag a non-issue. For instance, if you're going to Germany and as the plane takes off, you realize that they would be going to bed in about six hours, you should start thinking about sleeping in six hours. I would take a sleeping pill to start switching my body clock before we ever landed in Germany. Then when I get there, I'm already rested and I began to assimilate into the new time zone. This can make a huge difference if you do it right. The first night, I take another sleeping pill to make sure I sleep through the night so that the next day my body has clearly adjusted to the new time zone. I do the same thing in reverse when I come home. 
I make sure to sleep when I'm supposed to be sleeping on the plane and take sleeping pills the first two nights after I return home. I don't want to be awake in the middle of the night. I learned this trick from a friend of mine based in Argentina who travels extensively around the world. Teddy taught it to me about 15 years ago, and it literally changed my life regarding jet lag. I don't even know what the word means anymore. 19. Smile and sell some flowers. Off script, I already told you a little bit about this story, but here are the details of it. I've talked repeatedly about the importance of greeting people with a smile and being friendly. There's a small backstory that will give you some insight into where I'm coming from. When I was 13 or 14 years old, I used to sell flowers on a corner in National City near San Diego. After school every day, I'd be dropped off on a corner with a bucket of flowers to sell. Every hour, the driver would have to come back and replenish my flowers because I had sold them all. I was the top salesperson five times over. No one could even come close to selling the amount of flowers I did. I was earning between $40 and $70 a night back in 1973 and would come home every night and iron my money to make it flat. I made so much money that when I was 15, I bought my first car and sailboat. My driver was astounded and couldn't figure out how I did it. It was so simple. All I did was smile at everybody nicely who stopped at the stop sign after leaving the freeway. Hello! Would you like to buy some flowers? With a grin from ear to ear, I guess everybody thought I looked like an innocent little cute boy. They would quickly hand me a $5 bill and I would hand them a bunch of roses as they drove off. Smile, smile, smile. Be nice and you will have a much better life. I actually reenacted this entire thing in a video called Paul's First Job. So if you go to YouTube or you go to Google and just type in my name, Paul Akers, Paul's First Job, you'll see me reenact this entire thing and you'll hear my 92-year-old mother tell the story of when I came home every night with piles of money at 13 years old. 20. Never miss a sunset. Forget about all the material things in life. All the things that we think are important, nice cars, nice homes, expensive vacations, all pale in comparison to quietly sitting on the beach as the sun goes down. When I see a sunset or the sunrise anywhere in the world, I pause. I have a grateful heart. How lucky am I to experience this wonder every day of my life? The one thing, look for patterns. Chapter 12, It's a Very Small World. I'm going to go off script immediately here. This is the last chapter in the book, and I got to tell you, I read this chapter with a very full heart. The stories I'm going to tell in this last chapter are really epic, and they really typify what my life has all been about, and particularly when it comes to travel. So I start this last chapter with gratefulness, happiness, and joy because it is one of the coolest stories ever. As a public speaker, I always start off my talks by saying, I have a true confession. I don't like lean. Then I pause, giving the audience enough time to wonder why they hired me to come talk to them about lean and tell them what a big difference it can make in their organization. Finally, I tell them the truth. I love lean. I really do love lean. It has given me so much in life. My passion for continuous improvement has connected me with people all over the world. People see me in action and they see my effectiveness and all around efficiency and are drawn to the concept of continuous improvement. They reach out to me and the next thing you know, we develop friendships that improve and enrich their lives and mine. People gravitate towards those who are passionate and positive. When you approach life with deep passion, you look for the best in others. It is inevitable that your life will be filled with adventure and happiness. You will make new friends wherever you travel. You will never forget them, and they will never forget you. Up to this point, I've told you travel stories with epic drama, colossal misunderstandings, and costly mistakes. All of these allow me to learn and improve so that my travel experiences will grow the smile on my face with each passing trip. Now I'm going to tell you a story that makes the world seem so tiny it will be hard to believe. 
As I said in the last chapter, our first trip to Africa was amazing. There is a saying that once you get the dirt of Africa between your toes, you will never get it out and you will have to return. We got the dirt not only in our toes, but also in our shoes, clothes, and everywhere else. So one year later, we headed back again, this time to explore Tanzania and Kenya. Our second trip was easier because we had some idea of what to expect. We were much more comfortable with Africa's simplicity and wildness. On the first trip, we had come to love the people of this continent. We made new friends and stayed in touch with them continually. We kept in contact with the rangers and lots of the people we met. It became normal for me to talk to someone in Africa on a weekly basis. Africa was no longer a distant and mysterious land. It was now a part of me. In the first few days in Tanzania, we visited Lake Manyara National Park. To get there, we flew into a small dirt runway where our ranger, Peter, picked us up in an open land cruiser. We spent the better part of the day wandering through the beautiful park over remote dirt roads. We made it to the end beyond Lake Manyara Tree Lodge, just as the sun was going down. We chose and beyond again because our first experience was so exceptional. The resort was called the Tree Lodge because the rooms there were built up in the trees on stilts. They had no glass windows, only simple screens to keep the animals out. This was somewhat unsettling because the area is famous for its tree-climbing lions. The first night, however, it was not lions that concerned us. It was leopards. Most of the night, we could hear a leopard panting outside our window, and the only thing between him and us was a thin piece of screen and the sheet covering our trembling bodies. Experiences like this are why I love Africa. They can make you a little tense, but you become addicted to the adventure, maybe the adrenaline. The next morning, we got up so early so that we could take a sunrise game drive and have breakfast overlooking the hot springs and beautiful Lake Manyara. At five o'clock, the porter came and knocked on our screen door with hot coffee and biscuits. We had just enough time to take a steaming outdoor shower with no protection from the wild animals, just me and my bare ass and that panting leopard before heading out for the drive. You can live every moment, every word of the following story. It is all documented in high definition. I produced a series of videos for each day we were in Africa, so the story can unfold right in front of you in living color. Believe me, I'm not exaggerating one word of this. It is all on camera, except for my bare ass, of course. Each video is professionally produced and will transport you to our land cruiser on the dirt roads of Africa. Each day, I took the video, did the narration and all the editing just in time using one-piece flow so there was never any batch work. I produced the videos while the stories were fresh in my mind. If I didn't like the camera angle or the narration or the lighting, the very next day I could improve my process and thus improve the quality of the video day after day. Continuous improvement. I love it. Most people would ask how it is possible to do so much. It's easy because lean thinking makes everything I do easy and fun. And the result is I get much more done than most people could ever dream of. My wife and I were getting ready to go when the Maasai warrior showed up at our front door holding a spear. He walked us down a sandy trail, scanning the bushes around us for lions and leopards. After a hundred yard walk of terror, we met Peter and climbed into the open land cruiser. It was a chilly morning, but we had a heavy blanket to put over us as we enjoyed the early morning sights and sounds. The only thing we had to worry about was lions jumping into the open truck and eating us as we meandered through the jungle. For the next hour, we observed wildlife as the forest came to life. Eventually, we stopped on a small ridge where Peter set up a small folding table with three chairs so we could eat breakfast and watch the sun come up over the lake. I'm going to go off script. I cannot tell you how beautiful this was and how remote it was and how we felt so small in the middle of God's creation. It was an epic experience. We sat down to eat a delicious meal of crepes, eggs, 
fresh fruit, hot coffee, and hot chocolate. I thought to myself how crazy it was to be 10,000 miles from home in the middle of nowhere, enjoying wonderful food, solitude, and nature in such a beautiful setting. It couldn't get any better than that. Up to this point, there had been absolutely no one else around. We weren't in a place where there were cars passing by every two or three minutes. You could go for hours without seeing anyone. It was just the land, the animals, and us, or so we thought. After a few minutes, I heard the sound of another range vehicle approaching from over the ridge. As it came closer, I realized it was not the typical Toyota Land Cruiser that is common in Africa. It was an older Range Rover from England, something you rarely see because they just aren't very reliable. Toyota, thanks to the company's lean and continuous improvement efforts, is famous for its quality and reliability. Its Land Cruiser has become the vehicle of choice for traveling in the rural parts of Africa. No other brand can survive the harsh African terrain. But this Range Rover had a certain charm to it, and it kind of felt like I was watching the movie Out of Africa as it approached. Being the videographer and storyteller that I am, I pulled out my camera to record the moment. Capturing a 10-second clip of this vehicle as it crossed in front of me would convey the romance of traveling across Africa. However, as the truck approached, it slowed down and stopped right next to me. I kept the camera rolling. As the man driving the car stopped and said, good morning, with a South African accent, I greeted him and told him what a cool truck he had. I said I was filming a little bit of it because it looked so interesting. The man was very friendly and did not mind at all. What came next surprised me, if not shocked me. He asked me if I'd ever been to Penda Forest Lodge. We were at least a thousand miles from the lodge and I had forgotten I was wearing the Penda Forest Lodge hat I bought a year before in South Africa, the same place we bought the famous $350 Swarovski binoculars. I told him we had gone there last year. I wondered how he knew where Penda Forest Lodge was, since it was in a place just as remote as where we were in Tanzania. Then, to my total shock, the man told me his son worked there as a ranger. I asked him if his name was James. And he and his wife both exclaimed, yes! (laughs) We told him how James was our first ranger when we came to Africa. Then he asked, are you Paul? (laughs) We were stunned and answered, yes. I'm going off script here. I got to compose myself because when I read this story, it's so emotional because it's so unbelievable. They said, we thought we recognized you from the videos you made and the eye pull you gave him, he explained. James' father pulled out his cell phone and dialed his son, who was in another remote African country on holiday. When James answered, his father said, you will never believe who we just met. In the middle of nowhere in Tanzania, Paul and Leanne Akers, James' father handed me the phone, and James and I went crazy with laughter and surprise. All of us couldn't believe what just had happened. What were the chances we would be in Africa again and meet his parents in this remote location so early in the morning? It is such a small world. A week later, we were in Kenya, far out in the middle of nowhere, staying in Klein's Camp, another of the and beyond resorts. We were en route to the Masamara Game Reserve because we wanted to see the great wildebeest migration in person. We could see at least 100,000 wildebeest stretching out as far as we could see. I asked Selu, our ranger, if we could leave the road and drive right into the center of them and let the herds envelop us. He said, sure, why not? I kept my camera rolling as I hung outside the Jeep to capture the drama of chasing wildebeest at 40 miles an hour. I was so caught up in everything that was going on that I didn't realize when my hat blew off my head. The hat that had brought me together with James's parents was now was now lying somewhere 
somewhere in the middle of the Maasai Mara. I was disappointed, but I knew there must be a reason. Life is not happenstance. There is so much to explore and learn. We are all so connected, and life is doing everything in its power to bring us together. The subtitle of this book is Travel Light with a Full Heart. As I bring this book to a close, I must tell you, my heart is full. Travel has been one of my most important elements of my own self-development. I first became attracted to travel because of my father and his intense pursuit of adventure. From an early age, he would load my mother, brother, and me in our Studebaker station wagon and drive across the country, visiting every state and national park across America. My best memories are sitting in the front seat on my mom's lap, chewing on the dashboard as we rambled down the road. (coughs) I managed to put a consistent row of teeth marks all the way across the front console and would have given anything to have a picture of that dashboard. Such tasty memories. It seemed like every summer we went on some wild adventure somewhere in the U.S., Canada, or Mexico. One summer, my dad loaded six Boy Scouts plus me into Don Longbottom's old Dodge van, and we drove over 3,000 miles to Canada, for the Boy Scout National Jamboree. For a group of 13-year-old boys, this was a high adventure. Along the way, we picked up two young hippie girls who were hitchhiking across America and gave them a ride for over 800 miles. We talked about everything with them, from sex, drugs, and rock and roll to becoming vegetarians. These girls made such a big impression on me. They were living life, They were out on some great adventure, and they weren't letting any inhibitions hold them back. I think my dad thought maybe the kids could learn something from this, and learn we did. They even convinced me to become a vegetarian and stop eating sugar for about one year. My dad also got a kick out of the fact that we were a gaggle of horny 13-year-old boys with two cute 20-year-old girls in the car, and we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Between my dad and those young girls, I came away with a burning sense of adventure that all the waters in Lake Michigan could not extinguish. Wow, what a ride. My taste for adventure travel runs deep in my family history. My grandfather left Greece in 1913 and immigrated to the United States to find a better life for his family. My dad was highly involved in Boy Scouts with me and I became an Eagle Scout Talk about burning resourcefulness and self-reliance into my psyche at an early age. I was continually active and spent much of my free time hiking up some massive mountain like Mount Whitney, canoeing down the Colorado River, descending into the Grand Canyon, or tracking up the Zion Narrows. A well-traveled friend of mine from South Africa once told me, that if you want to remove all bigotry, racism, and political tension from the world, all you need to do is get people to travel. In the process, you will gain a deep appreciation and understanding of all the different cultures, languages, and religions. I couldn't agree more. People are basically good, kind-hearted, willing to help, and desiring friendship and understanding almost everywhere in the world. One of my favorite illustrations of this comes from the Kazakh people. I have spent so much time in Kazakhstan, and I've never felt such warm hospitality from any other group of people. My Kazakh friends explain to me that the reason they are such open and giving people is because their ancestors were nomads living in tents in the middle of a very hostile climate. They would go months without seeing anyone. So when someone did wander across their pastures, they would welcome them in with open arms and treat them like family. This is how the Kazakh people learned about what was going on in the outside world. This is how they stimulated their minds. That's what travel does. It stimulates your mind and warms your heart. If sometime in the future you should stumble across my Pindaforest hat in the middle of Kenya, Please come into my tent. 
sit down and enjoy a meal. I want to know about your adventures and your travels to distant lands. Tell me what you've learned and I will tell you about my journey and my wonderful friends. As my dad always said, life is an adventure and a life filled with travel is the best adventure in the world. I always end my show, The American Innovator, with these words. Life is an adventure. Go out and learn and improve. You can make a difference. You can change the world. People always ask me why I make videos, write books, and make almost everything I do available for free. The answer is really simple. My dad taught me to love life and to share it with everyone. He expected nothing in return, but he relished the twinkle in someone's eyes when they discovered something they didn't know. I'm just doing what my dad modeled for me. Like my father, I get great satisfaction when I see other people learn and improve their lives. So go out and learn and improve. We can change the world. The one thing, we are connected and traveling to distant lands is the thread that brings us closer together. Whatever you do, travel light with a full heart. You've been listening to Lean Travel, written and narrated by Paul A. Akers. For all of the lean resources and videos you've heard Paul talking about, you can find those at paulacres.net. That's also where you'll find contact information to have Paul come speak on Lean Live. Again, that's paulacres.net. And thanks for listening to Lean Travel, copyright Fast Cap Press.